I don't think it's on, yeah. Good morning, Good morning, how are you? Good morning. Good. Welcome to CSIS. My name is Sarah Ladislaw. I am the Senior Vice President and Director of the Energy and National Security Program here. We are very pleased to have uh, all of you with us, uh, both here in the room and around the world and the country uh, watching on webcast, uh, for today's event on energy infrastructure uh, and investment in Asia. This is a really popular topic. We've actually done a number of different events looking at component pieces of this issue. Uh, it's been recognized for a long period of time that Asia is not only geostrategically important for a whole bunch of reasons, but in my world, which is the energy world, um, they're really the driver of a, a huge amount of energy demand and the way in which investment takes place uh, in Asia in the energy space will have a lot uh, of implications for energy security, for climate change, for environmental uh, implications. Uh, and also for thinking about uh, future trends in the energy sector. And so we are very pleased to be able to have uh, a robust set of discussions today, um, in particular about uh, the way in which uh, a, a uh, Asia Edge, a, a US government initiative focusing on this issue that is gonna be celebrating its one year anniversary this month, uh, uh, is, is sort of uh, tackling those issues. Um, before we get started, I just want to remind everybody this event is on the record, so when you ask questions, we'll leave about 10 minutes at the end of this session for some questions. Please uh, use the microphone uh, and, uh, and wait for the microphone to ask those questions. Also, we care about your safety quite a bit here at CSIS. This is our building, so if there is an emergency or some sort of incident, please just wait for myself and my colleagues to give you some direction, but do make a mental note of where the emergency exits are here in the building. Uh, we are very pleased to get this discussion started off today with uh, two uh, uh, people who uh, are, are really sort of uh, lead thinkers here in Washington uh, in terms of engagement with the Asia Pacific region uh, in energy and infrastructure build out. Uh, we've got Senator Cory Gardner here, who is a, a fifth generation Coloradan uh, and a Coloradan through and through. You've got right. both your degrees from there. And my student loan. And your <laughs> <laughs> we always remember where those are, aren't we, don't we? Uh, and, uh, and has been uh, here in Washington uh, before, uh, before becoming a member of the House of Representatives in 2005. He was served as a legislative assistant and director here in Washington. Uh, has always been a champion of energy efficiency and, uh, and, uh, and energy policy, but is particularly well suited for today's event because uh, both serves on the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, the chairman of the Subcommittee on Energy, uh, and then also the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, uh, and where he leads the Subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, and International Cybersecurity Policy. So thank you very much thank for you. being here this morning. Thank Senator. you very much. Yeah. And then Frank Fannin, who uh, serves as the Assistant Secretary uh, for the Bureau of Energy Resources at the U.S. Department of State, where he oversees U.S. foreign policy and the critical intersection of energy and national security. Uh, promotes U.S. interests to ensure energy resources are used to increase economic opportunity, stability, and prosperity around the world, and also advises the Secretary on these matters. Thanks for coming back, Frank. Delighted to be here. Thank you. So to get us started, I, I really think you know we'll have uh, uh, two panel discussions to follow this one that focus on the role of various governments in the region, including the U.S. government, in advancing some of the objectives of this initiative. Uh, and, and quite frankly, just energy infrastructure uh, build out in Asia. And then one that focuses on the private sector and other trends. But I was really hoping the two of you could help set the strategic context for why we should be paying attention to these issues in the first place. So Frank, I mentioned that this is uh, sort of nominally the one year anniversary mm -hmm. of, uh, of this initiative. Can you remind us what Asia Edge is and why it matters? Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for having us and convening this event. So you're right about uh, about a one year anniversary. So uh, July <coughs> last year, Secretary Secretary Pompeo announced uh, the economic uh, our economic engagement in the Indo-Pacific region, which comprised of three core pillars: digital economy, infrastructure, and energy. Uh, and, and we focus on these is because in, in the region because it's it's obviously geopolitically important in terms of the broader. Uh, broader strategy, um, but, it, but in particular with respect to energy, this is where the action is. Um, I think the numbers are, are pretty profound. 60% of all energy demand growth through 2040 is going to be in the Indo-Pacific region. 
Uh, you have this remarkable dynamism that's occurring there, uh, the, the, the bringing up, uh, the development of middle classes who never existed before. I mean, the demographic shifts alone are, are tremendous, and all of these people want the same quality of life and deserve the same quality of life that we enjoy here. They want to have uh, energy to power their economies and do so sustainably and, and, ha and improve the health and quality of, of, for their children. Uh, and, and having energy is, is key to that. Asia Edge, uh, it's in Washington, so it has to be an acronym. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's enhancing in development and growth through energy. Um, so it really has four key components. First, supporting the energy security of friends and allies in the region. Second, uh, to create open, efficient, transparent energy markets. Third, uh, to support uh, free, fair, and reciprocal en energy trading re relationships, and fourth, uh, to promote uh, open access for energy for all. So these are the, the big thematic ideas uh, that underpin all of our work. Um, but of course, we lead at the State Department uh, this effort, but it is a whole of government effort. Uh, there are eight, uh, in total, eight different federal agencies involved in this. Uh, it's a tremendous undertaking to harness the entire scope of the USG and focus it on the region and the economic opportunities that it, uh, it can provide. Um, this also, uh, it's important to note, it's working also hand in glove with the private sector as well um, to help them to understand the opportunity that the region presents uh, and work with the governments to, to facilitate the appropriate conditions that would incent U.S. firms to be there. Senator Garner, from your perspective, because you think about Asia from a broad sort of geostrategic perspective as well as having the energy interest, how, how should we be thinking about the basket of both challenges and opportunities in engaging the region? Yeah, absolutely. You know, going back to a, a testimony we heard from it was Congressman Forbes uh, several years back before the Asia subcommittee where he said, just looking at Asia, a, a region of the world that has, or soon to have, 50% of global population, 50% global GDP, you know, five of our seven uh, mutual defense alliances, treaties, or, or partnerships, uh, the largest standing armies in the world, the region of the world where most global population will travel, where most global transit will, will occur. Uh, and you know the importance of it. Uh, Frank mentioned, Secretary Fannin mentioned the, the sheer number of uh, energy consumption uh, percentages and increases that we'll see. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to visit, uh, we were in Myanmar, and we were visiting with uh, a number of leaders in Myanmar, and one of the closest associates to Aung San Suu Kyi had said to me, I, I said, what are, what are the key things that need to be accomplished in Myanmar for this new, new government to be successful? And uh, the three things, obviously, number one was the civil war strife and how that can be addressed. And you know, Congress can affect and has affected uh, the policies to try to, to address that. But obviously, we can't simply pass legislation to uh, wipe out a, a civil war uh, or uh, genocide. The second thing that, we, that they said that we should do would be to address uh, the property rights issues and agriculture. But the third thing was electricity. Mm -hmm that if they didn't provide stable electricity to the people of Myanmar, that it would show that their lives hadn't improved and it would get a re give a reason for uh, the people of Myanmar to perhaps go back to something else or look for a different, uh, uh, different leadership. Uh, and so uh, at that point, we started looking at, okay, what can we do in Asia specifically, you know, based on some of the things that we've learned on Power Africa? Uh, you know, what can we do to try to reflect that in Myanmar? How do we build a, um, a Asia-U.S. energy partnership that builds on our LNG uh, powers and our opportunities for renewable energy? And that's really what we did through the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, uh, which complements, I think, uh, quite well uh, the work with uh, Asia Edge and provides funding uh, to, to many of these programs. I want to come back to the sort of you know, legislative efforts that assist this program and, and, and where those might be going in the future and those types of things. But one of the things, uh, both of you have mentioned the strategic importance of the region. I will say there's a lot of uh, interest in, in the dynamics here with, with this initiative, but just generally U.S. policy in the region as it relates to its positioning with regard to China, right? So it's, it's not, it's not hard to conceive of the fact that there's a, a huge player in the region that's also investing a huge amount of money in, in infrastructure. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, from both of your perspectives, how these types of initiatives should position themselves relative to the activities of China in the region as well. 
Sure. Uh, so, obviously, yeah, China's investing a lot of money. Uh, but it's a, it's a completely uh, different approach than we, we take. The way we engage governments is really one in partnership. Um, we spend a lot of time working very closely with, with governments to understand their own self-determined energy pathway. What is it that they want to do? Why do they want to do it? Do, what are the gaps uh, that they need filled so they can accomplish their ambition? Mm -hmm. um, what we do is to facilitate those appropriate conditions um, so that they can you know, move from having a demand for energy, take Vietnam, double-digit demand growth for energy every year. It's tremendous. Uh, they need to get, to, they need to develop some gas, they need to develop uh, an LNG importing infrastructure, but you can't just turn the lights on and make, make it happen. So what we do is to facilitate the regulatory conditions and work with them so that they can, of course, do that. We do this based on partnership and out of respect for the sovereignty of the countries. And what we, when we harness our private sector and engage our private sector, there, is no, there are no strings attached to that. That is a, that is a relationship that is done by the, the buyer uh, and the seller and the U.S. firm. Uh, and the U.S. firm is doing it complete, with complete transparency and in respect for that government. That's a different, distinctive model than the approach that, that China has taken. Um, now, they give it a name now, you know, the debt diplomacy model. It's a different, it's a different uh, thing entirely. It's, uh, even the financing, it tends to be state-driven. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a different equation entirely. I think it's distinctive, and I think it's the way our approach is quite successful. Um, I, go, I travel around the world. I know this is focused on, and appropriately so, on, on, on the Indo-Pacific and Asia. Uh, but everywhere I go, just, a, just an observation, Everywhere I go or when ministers come to see me in Washington, they all say the same thing. They want U.S. investment. They want U.S. companies. Um, because they know that U.S. companies have the best health, safety, and environmental records. They have the best technology. They have the best engineering. Uh, and, and they do so transparently. Um, so what we seek to do is help create those conditions so they can attract that U.S. investment. Yeah, well, I think you, right now, if you look at some of the, the secretary mentioned uh, Vietnam. I mean, look at the uh, news recently about China uh, trying to, you know, <coughs> force its will over Vietnam uh, in energy production uh, in various so you know those uh, territorial disputes that occur. And that's not just one example, but it's many examples. And I think uh, we'll see more and more of that. Uh, you know, you compare what's happened in Europe with Nord Stream pipeline and how that debate has, uh, has rolled out. You look what happened to Poland several years ago, Ukraine several years ago, with reliance on energy sources from countries that have a political interest in causing or, uh, causing or, or in, you know, creating uh, economic harm uh, for a political uh, opportunity. Uh, that's not what we want to do. Uh, we want to give abundant, affordable energy that we develop with U.S. jobs and know-how here, uh, send that uh, to uh, places throughout Asia, help them with energy efficiency, help them drive down emissions, help them with new technologies, uh, helps U.S. consumers, it helps build opportunities, partnerships, and capacities in and throughout Asia. And that's really what this is about. And, uh, you know, I, I think the, the Secretary is exactly right when he talks about U.S. stability, U.S. law, and the certainty of the values that we bring to it. Uh, they know what it is. It's very transparent and it's in the best interests uh, of our partners and not the best interests uh, of uh, you know, a political objective. And just to play devil's advocate for a minute, I mean, and you brought up sort of the enabling legislation for some of these activities. There's a, there's a concern that maybe the U.S. doesn't have all the tools necessary to be able to affect the region or to play that same role. Some of it has to do with financing, the size of the financing that we can bring to the table. What are the signs that, that you all have uh, that, that we're, we're able to sort of crack some of those more difficult things? You mentioned Power Africa. I love Power Africa as a really good example of moving projects through a pipeline that exists more quickly. But is this about, do we need additional capabilities to be able to play this role in the region, or is it really just about being strategic about the resources we have? Well, I, first I'd like to compliment uh, the Senator on, on this passage of his legislation. Um, that, that, was, that was meaningful, and it was under considerable bipartisan uh, approach, too. Um, in terms of the tools, uh, Asia Edge, I said, is a whole of government approach. Uh, it's a year old, young now, and, and it, it's, but it, I think it's, it's, not a, it's not a stagnant thing. 
it continues to evolve and the tools continue to be uh, to be modified. Uh, part of uh, Asia Edge, when it, upon the announcement, was also the the uh, modification of OPIC, the transformation of OPIC into the, the Development Finance Corporation. This is a meaningful change which will allow, creates a valuable tool to help the private sector to, to harness U.S. government support in, in, uh, in, in transactions all around the world, in particular in the region. Um, so I just point to that as to one very important example. We're not seeking to have a, 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 a uh, a dollar to dollar kind of comparison with China. Uh, people will sometimes ask you, well, how does this compare? And it's not as much money. That's not, that was never the intention. We don't operate with a, our state owned enterprises. We don't have them. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's uh, an unfair comparison. Um, but the tools continue to evolve. When I was in Bangkok uh, some weeks ago, uh, USAID just announced a, a new facility working with the Asia Development Bank, $100 million facility to catalyze billions of dollars. And so it just demonstrates the, the innovation that, uh, that this administration is pursuing opportunity in the region. Um, so I, I would say uh, we certainly welcome more resources, um, but the, the tools that we have uh, are going through uh, ongoing evolution to the, to the betterment of the ability to execute projects in the region. I think uh, during the Great Depression in the United States, it was a chicken in every pot. And uh, uh, I, you know, what we're not talking about with energy and our exports or opportunity in Asia is a refinery on every block. I don't think that's what we're trying to <laughs> accomplish. But through the BUILD Act uh, and through the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, Asia Edge and other programs, we are beginning to see uh, resources and uh, you know, a true flesh on the bones of a uh, Asia presence strategy. And I think that's incredibly important because we can have talking points and we can have action. Uh, one of the, the, I think, most important things to realize is you're not being outcompeted if you're not competing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how do we show up? How are we in the region? How is that presence uh, uh, being used? So the BUILD Act uh, will help with a number of uh, issues outside of, of energy. Uh, AARIA will help on energy specifically, and BUILD will help with energy as well. Uh, Asia Edge, uh, obviously, as a part of this, uh, incredibly important. Uh, and so but the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and the international programs that they share is a huge part of this. Um, you know, these all go to building that. And I, I am worried, though. So, so we, have the, we have the capability to do this uh, through these programs. Do we have the capacity? Now, one thing that I am concerned about and our presence in, in Asia or Europe or wherever it is on energy is the U.S. regulatory environment. Um, right now, if you look at FERC, uh, and you look at some of the approval processes that are taking place. Uh, you know, Jordan Cove is an LNG export facility in northwest United States that still hasn't been approved. How are we going to get uh, energy out of the United States and into Asia if we cannot export it? How are we going to uh, get uh, energy to the Jordan Cove facility if we can't build a pipeline uh, to that facility? So uh, some of the biggest uh, constraints on our ability to impact global energy trade supplies sales may be our very own backyard mm -hmm. uh, because we're, we're hamstringing or, or handcuffing ourselves uh, and preventing ourselves from doing it. So I am worried about uh, the U.S. Uh, approach in certain areas uh, that could prevent us from utilizing the full, uh, the full array of opportunities uh, presented. It's an interesting point because I think a, a, a number of elements of this, uh, particularly as we talk to people who are operating in the region, a lot of it is seen as the U.S. being able to put forth some of its new kind of energy abundance into the world, right? But, but so two <coughs> questions about that. I think you bring up a good point, which is we can only be sort of good stewards of the things that we're selling abroad if we're doing everything at home to be able to make those opportunities happen. But then the sort of second question is, there's no sort of like buy America provisions of this initiative. You know, it's not necessarily that they have to buy U.S. gas or that they have to buy U.S. products. It's really about enabling a lot of um, standards and, and sort of uh, regulatory environments abroad so that they can make good choices that are in their interest as well. Or, or is it really a little bit more mercantilistic? It's really the U.S. would really like to sell what it has there. H how, do we, how do you think about that? Because I know you get that question a lot. Yeah, the, no, the, there is no uh, Buy America provision. There, there, again, the Secretary, uh, Secretary Pompeo, uh, when he, he, he spoke, he was the first sitting Secretary of State to speak at the CIRA conference. It just mm -hmm. underscores the importance, the recognition of uh, what you're speaking to, is that the U.S. is an energy player 
it, it, it's, it's an incredible uh, new opportunity in how we approach our foreign policy in so many dimensions. Um, but he also said, it was very explicit, that there's no strings attached. So when we work with part in partnership to countries, uh, it's, it's to help them realize their own ambition. And um, we're confident that if there is a transparent level playing field, that our U.S. businesses will win every time. Because they provide uh, all of the, it's the best of, of whatever category. Um, so we're very, very confident in that. And one of the things that we're doing also, uh, and you'll probably hear about it later in some of the other panels, is we can't, we, we, com countries ought not just look at cost when they, when they uh, procure. They have to look at the quality of the thing that they're buying to. Uh, and, and whether it's actually in their interest to source from X supplier or X country. Uh, we mentioned energy efficiency a few times. In, in, in Southeast Asia, depending on the country, it's upwards of 40% of energy consumption is coming from air conditioning. Uh, that's tremendous drain on when you see these countries that have double digit energy demand growth every year. We have program to help establish standards through a variety of multilateral fora like, such as ASEAN to improve the energy efficiency of air conditioning. Now, Ideally, it'd be, you know, hopefully that U.S. firms will be able to provide that, but it's, it's really about improving the conditions on the ground in those countries, irrespective of uh, the U.S. Uh, private sector uh, work. Yeah. Um, but again, if we have a level playing field, we're confident that U.S. firms will do just fine. Well, and just to add to that, too, I think we talked about this earlier, that if you think about energy efficiencies and what it means, uh, in the, the utility sector in the United States, 50% of the, uh, the emission reductions they've achieved have come in the form of energy efficiencies. That's greater than fuel switching or the reductions from renewable energies combined. And so the impact that you could have uh, you know, when you have that kind of growth in air conditioning or other heavy um, energy users uh, with energy efficiencies is tremendous. And, you know, meeting with uh, countries in Asia like uh, uh, the, I met with recently the, the head of the, the, the Philippine, basically, Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, and she was talking about uh, the opportunities for renewable energy, trading information, learning from NREL uh, and other, uh, other, other U.S. companies and how to do that. It's, goes perfectly in line with what the Secretary said. Yeah, I'm going to open for one really quick round of questions before I do, Senator Gardner, you just brought up NREL, which I, I uh, think the national labs are just a wonderful resource we have here in the United States. How do we work to make sure that, you know, labs like NREL, you know, one that's close to your heart, can engage in these kinds of activities and work in these initiatives? Yeah, work? absolutely. So NREL does have a sort of international programming. We have to make sure that uh, we uh, that we adequately fund it and resource that and get behind that with the support from Congress and well as well as the work that they're doing. Uh, I mean, it's pretty remarkable what they're doing. I mean, Provscite crystals that you can now uh, paint a solar panel onto something and, you know, instant uh, solar panels. Now, we're probably a little bit away from having that being uh, large scale. We'll be on my house uh, but, <laughs> uh, but again, I mean, the fact that we're, we, I've done it. I've painted a solar panel at InRel. Uh, and, and it generated electricity, and it was pretty incredible. So um, to have those kind of partnerships uh, with people, imagine the transformation of the world, and we've seen it, but the power of one light bulb can do. And with that light bulb is emission-free, what that would mean. It's pretty, pretty remarkable. It's remarkable. Okay. We'll take a quick round of questions. I'm going to gather a few because I can imagine there'll be a few. If you can wait for a microphone, answer the, or state your name and affiliation and a uh, question in the form of a question. We'll gather a few and then take as many as we can in about the 10 minutes we've got left. So any questions? We've got one here, one here. So Manja, right here. We'll go here. Uh, Seth Rose, NRF Institute. Uh, thank you for talking about air conditioning. Um, one of the uh, issues that we look at is, is some of the best technology is, is actually coming out of Japan. Uh, companies like Daikin is the largest air conditioning company in the world, and the American companies that, that we've known you know, since we were kids, those brands are buying technologies and partnering with uh, the Asian companies. And is there anything we can do to encourage the uh, American companies, the brands that that you know, uh, to, to begin to manufacture in the U.S. rather than simply uh, uh, buy Asian technology and then brand it with their, their American brands. Okay, hold your answers. We'll go to this gentleman for a question. Hi, Diego. Hi, Diego Garrison with Green Power Technology. Um, I had a question more focused to the secretary. Uh, 
a lot of these Asian countries now uh, have goals themselves with in a, after the climate accord um, in Paris. And I was wondering now if Asia Edge is looking to work with countries towards those goals or if Asia Edge is focused more on their, the four strategies that you listed and, and working towards those and setting their own goals. Thank you. Great. And we can take one more and then see right here. David Lewis, Energy Capital of Vietnam. Um, uh, There's some comments earlier about uh, policies, and, and I, there was a wonderful article in the Wall Street Journal talking about discrepancies as far as um, uh, price per MBTU within the US. And uh, there's a location <coughs> in the Pacific Northwest and in New York where it reached $200 last year, whereas in the Permian, they were spending $9 to dispose of it. The opportunity for domestic policies to improve the streamline of, of infrastructure that enables delivery of natural gas across both the U.S. and abroad, and then the recognition of the impact that as the proliferation of LNG or natural gas in Asia increases, what it's displacing is coal and that ability to have a positive impact on the environment so that perhaps maybe there's a better recognition across um, both parties of the environmental benefits of natural gas. Is there a question in there? Yeah, just wondering whether or not there is a sense of uh, awareness or, or conversation happening the within the parties yeah. because the concern is we switch policies. Right now under this administration we're doing this, maybe under a different administration are we going to switch back uh -huh. and whether or not there's a recognition of this is broader, uh, broader than just about uh, energy itself. Okay, great, thank you. I think a few of those were directed towards you, but let's... Uh sure, thank you. Um, so with respect to... Uh, the, the type of technolo technology and licensing <clears throat> and uh, U.S. firms developing their own. Um, I mean, I can't really speak to the, the investment decisions of U.S. companies into their R&D budgets and, 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 or whether it makes more sense for them to partner with, with another company, a Japanese company in your example. I, I would say, though, that, that we work in partnership with, with, with countries, including Japan, uh, very, very closely. Uh, they, the Japanese, uh, we have uh, the Japan-U.S. Uh, strategic Energy Partnership, uh, wherein the Japanese recently just committed uh, several uh, billions uh, in support of our Asia Edge concepts. Um, we work with the Australians. We have, uh, we, I launched, launched last year a, a strategic energy dialogue with the Australian government, uh, again, working in partnership uh, I've spent some time in Seoul, and the Koreans also have a, a new shift that complements Asia Edge uh, objectives quite, quite clearly. So I, I would just say that um, we are doing this in close collaboration with, with partners in the region. Um, I travel around the world, and the, the only place really that climate is, is the first thing people talk about is when I'm in Brussels. When I'm in the region, um, what they talk about is wanting cleaner air be to avoid premature deaths of their kids and, and, and their elderly. That's the focus. The, I spoke before uh, about that we work in collaboration and partnership with, part with countries based on their own self-determined path. That often means they want renewables, they want more gas. And so that's the focus, is how do we provide them the power that they need in the way that uh, is, is sustainable as possible. That's the objective. Um, and if the, the co-benefit of that is reduced greenhouse gas emissions, that's fantastic. Uh, so it, it really is part and parcel of what we do and how we go about doing it. And obviously, we spoke, spoke about the energy efficiency model. But I, I would just say that, uh, that when we partner, we're talking, we're truly all of the above. We want to see more renewable companies. I spent some time out in California uh, a few weeks ago to, to make sure that renewable companies out there were aware of what we're doing and aware of the opportunities, uh, and we really welcome them to, to engage with us more frequently. That's great. Senator Gardner, I don't know if we want to make any comments on any of that, but I, you know, one of the things I thought, um, because you've got this unique purview, we think both about the domestic energy policy side of the equation and then also about international foreign policy. There's a lot of interest. I, I thought this kind of dealt a little bit with the gentleman's last question. There's a lot of interest, and my colleague just testified on it the other day, in 
how the U.S. is thinking, given all of the energy advantages we have now, about our commitment to international energy systems and multilateralism, right? So because we have so much energy, do we care less about those things? Do we care more about our contributions to those things? And, and particularly in these growing gas markets, what kind of sort of, you know, how, how do you spend your time thinking about sort of that nexus between our domestic energy story and our contributions to that international multilateralism? Well, I think a, a great deal amount of time and thought goes into that because, uh, you know, I can remember several years ago when uh, this is probably 2010, 2014 time frame where Eastern European countries were spending significant amounts of time trying to uh, get the United States to export uh, LNG to try to change its crude oil export uh, provisions, try to engage more on trade because of their security concerns, and uh, and so I, so you know as a policymaker, I look at it. Okay, how do we how do we make sure that that uh, air pollution that travels from China over to the United States uh, and affects Rocky Mountain National Park can be dealt with? How do we address that? How do I address the uh, gas that's being produced in Weld County that creates 250,000 direct and indirect jobs? How do I make sure that those communities remain strong when there's a lot of production in the Midwest occurring and, and maybe there's no capacity for a Rockies gas to make it to the Midwest? So we need that Western-based outlet. So that's an that's a uh, economic security question. So you have the national security question, the international security uh, opportunity, and a domestic economic security Opportunity. So those are the things that, that are very much a part of this. And so that's why with the Asia Edge program, the ARIA, uh, the other work that uh, the Secretary is doing around the globe on energy is so important. And Congress, and to the point of this last question, the, the way that you address uh, policies from administration to administration is not by executive agreement or order, but by congressional action. Uh, and so that's why it's so important that we have something like the Asia Reassurance Initiative uh, in place because it directs the creation of a U.S.-Asia energy partnership that's not just about fossil fuels, but it's also about renewable energy and other opportunities. And so uh, the, the congressional action is, is critically important to make this last from administration to administration to administration. Uh, but it is very much a part of what we think about in terms of international policy. Uh, I think energy creates, just going back to the conversation I had in Myanmar. Yeah. The way they were going to help build a brighter future was with energy, and they looked at the United States to help them do that. Mm. Okay, we can take one more quick round if we've got a few questions. Let me see, show of hands. We answered every question. <laughs> every question about energy, right there. Wait for the microphone, please. Sorry. Thank you. I have a question about Chinese investment in Africa and how um, the U.S., um, in your view, can either uh, work to support U.S. companies investing in Africa or uh, counter Chinese investment there? Okay, any others? No. This is what happens at the beginning of events. Oh, there you go. People are very reticent. It's sort of like church. There you go. Come to the Hi. front. Thank you. I'm Tobin. <clears throat> Excuse me. I intern upstairs. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak a little more about why the BUILD Act is going to be a new page for U.S. engagement in Asia, and particularly why the re rearrangement into the DFIC is going to be sort of a, a, a new, a, really a new page for us. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Okay, we'll take those two. Uh, so uh, do, would you like to talk about Africa? Sure. We're, it is technically. <laughs> 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 it's in the south. Um, yeah, so our, uh, we, we very much, uh, of course, are continue to be engaged in, on the continent. And um, we were focused on, again, it's, it's really based on that same self-determination model um, where we work with countries on what is their pathway uh, and creating those economic opportunities. Um, we don't look at any of this in the, con in the direct way of, well, it's, we need to be there because China is and we want to combat that. Uh, we approach things uh, with a very inclusive mindset and providing and making sure that not just Africa but around the world understand that there's an alternative to debt diplomacy and debt traps. Um, we don't create those, uh, we, we don't direct our private sector. They're, and they're, companies make investment decisions because they have, uh, they want to find a return on investment. Uh, they have a suite of shareholder concerns that need to be addressed uh, and expectations. Uh, and that's the motivation for our private sector. What we seek to do is to help create the appropriate above ground conditions. And if 
countries and investors and invest in countries like China were to behave appropriately based on international norms, then would anyone, there wouldn't be, a, this wouldn't be such a topic. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case. And so what we seek to do uh, is help create a broader sense of awareness of, of, of the choice. Senator Garner, you want to take a question about? Yeah, it, it, I can, it goes back to uh, how we are uh, showing up in the region to compete, to be present and actually having tools to be able to use in that competition and in that presence. So the BUILD Act uh, obviously means more dollars, more opportunity to use those dollars, more private sector engagement, more private sector partnership with the dollars that can be readily made uh, available and the new sort of expanded pool uh, of dollars to the private sector and uh, uh, other opportunities to, to engage uh, U.S. Uh, investment through U.S. aid and development dollars too. So that's really what it, that's really what it means and, and how it's going to work. And I think it's actually going to be, uh, you're going to see more sort of programs dollars on target, so to speak, and that is engaged in businesses and projects uh, to, to seed them, to get them going and other things. Look, some of the dollars that, that we've talked about is pencil dust compared to uh, some of the other uh, dollars that are being thrown around by China. But if you look at the stability, the, the, the law, the practices, the standards uh, that we bring, you can't compare them to anywhere else. And people understand that because we want to do this, uh, whether it's a Pacific Island uh, or, or you know, somebody uh, throughout uh, the ASEAN regions and nations, we want to make sure that it's in their best interest and benefits them long term. Um, so I think that's exactly what the Build Act can do and some of the other provisions of ARIA and, and other places. If I could just add a, a little bit additional to the, to the points the Senator made. Specifically, the, the U.S. engagement and in, in, in the U.S. government's financial engagement in, in working with, with the, the private sector, there was considerable restrictions on what they could do, the amount of financing. Um, one of the, some of the really critical things that the bill that did was not just elevate the, double the amount of financing available under, under OPIC or FDAC, uh, but also remove some of those restrictions. And now they can actually take equity in interest in projects. That was never something they could do before. Uh, we focus a lot on the DFC because it's new, but we also have XM now as, as backup. Um, these are important, important tools. Um, and you know, the, the region, you, we were talking about the, the development of new middle classes that never existed before. That also requires a whole new approach on how they price energy in, in the countries. You have, uh, firstly, you have people who may not have lacked reliable energy for, for forever. Now they're starting to get it. But it's also, it's been heavily subsidized. So how does a firm, a US company, come in and develop a, a, a new solar project, which they want to do, how do, they, how do they monetize that? And how did, what, is, what is that payback term over a 20 year time horizon when you have an opaque, opaque pricing of energy? So some of the work we're doing is to help uh, make uh, the government aware of some of the reforms they need to do to, to catalyze this kind of private sector investment and having people from OPIC engaged and commerce and commercial law program. All of these are some of the elements that we're, we're training on, on the target to help them. And I just would add on to that too. You know, one of the biggest successes that we've had over across several administrations in energy efficiency is the use of performance contracts, ESCOs and USCOs. Billions of dollars have been saved. The American taxpayers have saved billions of dollars through performance contracting, all because we've used this sort of a private sector arrangement to make federal buildings more energy efficient. That has saved billions of dollars, creates thousands of private sector jobs at no cost to the taxpayer. Think about the opportunities in Asia and around the globe that you have with something like performance contracts. But you have to have stability and rule of law and contractual enforcement uh, and anti-corruption practices in place to make that all work. Because, if you, because that is something that is totally reliant uh, on, on, on the rule of law uh, and, and a, a absence of corruption within the system. And if you can achieve that, Think about the money that can be saved, the jobs that could be created, and the good and benefit to the environment that would follow. Yeah. 
Well, listen, you both have done a great job getting us kicked off on the right foot for the uh, for the rest of the event today. I think we're going to have some of those agencies talking yep. very specifically about some of the things that are going on in the region, plus some of the partner countries and some other experts as well. I just want to say thank you very much for both of you for your leadership on this issue and for sharing some of your thoughts why this is so important today. So please join me in thanking the Senator and Secretary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a very uh, short break and welcome up the second panel for discussion. So thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Grab my mic. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I came yes. back from Delhi this weekend. Yeah. From Delhi originally? Or? Okay, yes. Um, I'm, I'm going to get started uh, while people are filing back in. So if um, everyone could come on back down from the terrace. Thanks so much. I know we have people watching online, and, and I know what it's like to watch and wonder what's uh, happening when people are speaking, and there's no noise. So, um, so um, well, welcome back. My name is uh, Matthew Goodman. I run the Global Economics Program here at CSAS. Uh, delighted to. 
uh, be, participate in this um, important uh, conference on energy and infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, this is a topic that I'm not an energy expert, so to put my cards on the table, but I am very interested in the rest of this story, uh, including uh, the Indo-Pacific, on which we do a lot of work, because that's where the money is um, in economics, um, and uh, infrastructure as well. We run uh, a project in my program called uh, Reconnecting Asia, which if you haven't been there, um, please go to reconnectingasia.csas.org, and you'll see a, um, a map of the Eurasian supercontinent, uh, and behind it a database of 14,000 uh, infrastructure projects, including uh, about 11,000 power uh, projects, uh, which is the biggest uh, mode we have there. We are adding transmission lines and uh, energy pipelines and LNG um, terminals as well, so it's a, an attempt uh, to be as comprehensive as we can in showing the, the story of in the infrastructure build out across this uh, large geography. Um, and we're doing, of course, analysis around what's driving this and what the implications are for economics in particular, but also for, um, you know, for geostrategy, geopolitics. So um, shameless, oh, no, the shameless advertising is not quite over. Uh, we produced um, a report called The Higher Road uh, in April, which um, was a product of a task force, which uh, my colleague Dan Rundy and I uh, ran, co-chaired by uh, former USTR Charlene Barshevsky and former um, National Security Advisor Steve Hadley. Um, this uh, is about infrastructure and how the U.S. can position itself in the inf infrastructure game in, in this part of the world, well, actually globally, uh, and what uh, sort of our stakes are and our tools and um, a, 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 the outlines of a strategy with some recommendations. So please uh, commend that to you. That's online um, at the CSAS site. So um, enough of the advertising. Um, I've uh, really got the, the experts up here uh, who will uh, illuminate you on, on these subjects. Uh, a great a diverse group um, of, of experts, starting with Gloria Steele on my immediate left, your right, who is assistant, uh, acting assistant administrator at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Uh, she's also senior uh, deputy assistant administrator for Asia, so she's got a lot of expertise in that part of the world. Um, Delighted to have Gloria with us. Um, uh, next to uh, her is Takeshi Komoto, who's Minister for Economy, Trade, and Industry and Energy at the Embassy of Japan, um, an old friend, and uh, delighted to have uh, Komoto-san with us as well. Next to him is Win Dong Trung, who is Counselor and the Head of the Economics Division at the Embassy of uh, Vietnam here in Washington, uh, also covers uh, the power sector, so we're delighted to have uh, Mr. Win with us. Um, next to him is uh, Arunush Chawla, uh, Chawla, who is the economic minister from the Embassy of India, um, who also covers the energy uh, uh, portfolio, uh, as well as broader economic issues. So delighted to have uh, you, Mr. Chawla. And at the end is Jim Sullivan, who is acting assistant secretary for the International Trade Administration at the Department of Commerce. He's also the deputy assistant secretary for services there. Um, and has an interesting background in, um, in the technology uh, 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 area, so, um, which is central to this story, by the way. Um, so let me um, go down the line. We don't have a huge amount of time, and I do want to bring the audience in uh, for questions, so I'm going to try to be as efficient as I can in getting through um, some, some basic uh, uh, issues here with the panel, but, uh, but we do want you to participate as well. So let me start with you, Gloria. Um, from a USAID perspective, what are your, um, how do you see the energy and infrastructure story in the Indo-Pacific and uh, what is USAID doing out there and trying to achieve? Yes, thank you very much for that question, Matt. Um, I don't know what was said before the, our panel, but just to review, a year ago, uh, Secretary Pompeo launched the Indo-Pacific strategy. And one of the four initiatives under the strategy is the energy, uh, which we call Asia Edge. It is because it, we recognize the very substantial growth potential of Asia, and Asia cannot grow without energy. And by 2030, we estimate about $15 trillion of energy investments will be needed. And um, just to review the, the, uh, the goals of the objectives of the uh, of Asia Edge is to improve energy security, improve access to energy at affordable prices, um, 
improve procurement, which is important to it, and of course, promote trade. And so in that connection, AID is implementing to support those uh, objectives. We are doing the same thing, building upon what our comparative advantage is, which is our presence on the ground, uh, having relationships with government, and so through technical assistance and capacity building, uh, that's how we, expect, uh, we intend to achieve uh, our objectives under the energy sector. Our objectives line up perfectly with EDGE. We want to make sure, we want to work with governments to improve their policies and strategies to make energy more affordable, more cost effective, uh, more readily available, and that would mean working on their procurement systems and um, and looking at um, using really uh, database decision making uh, in the energy sector and of course promoting uh, integrated trade in energy across the region. Just a few examples to show what I mean. Uh, when I first arrived in the Philippines, I found out that one of the reasons uh, the Philippines was not punching at its weight uh, in the manufacturing sector was because energy was very, very expensive. Electricity was very expensive. And I found out that the reason for this was because decisions were made on contracts for, uh, for energy when there was an energy shortage without really much basis for decision making. And so one of the things that I did was I approached the government to uh, build capacity for energy analysis, policy analysis, um, and you know, four years later, the and we situated it in the state university so that it would be like a research and technical assistance center for uh, the government. And um, four years later, uh, the the Congress of the Philippines has adapted that and funded funded it. So while we seed funded it, they have now owned it. That's the sort of thing we want to do. We're doing the same thing in Nepal, um, providing technical assistance, uh, which led to the the, the establishment of the. Uh, uh, Electricity Regulation Commission, which now the MCC and the government of Nepal are building on. In India, on, in, uh, in the, on a trade, uh, we worked with the government of India um, so that uh, they had made changes on their policy guidelines that would allow other countries to use their transmission lines. And so now uh, countries like Nepal and Bangladesh are able to, which allows trade across the region. And we can go on and on, uh, same with Vietnam, where we worked with the government of Vietnam in the development of their uh, use of solar power, uh, using both a Vietnamese, uh, local Vietnamese company and linking them up with uh, an American company. The same with um, Indonesia where we have done a similar thing, this time with wind energy. So trying to focus on renewable energy and making it accessible and more affordable. Great, um, excellent. Well, I, I, I do have a, a follow-up question too, but I wanna make sure everybody gets a chance to speak initially and then I'll bring you back in. I'm gonna go sure. down to the other end of the, uh, the row to Jim Sullivan uh, because uh, Frank Fannin was um, just up here saying that uh, this, um, uh, well, the Indo-Pacific strategy generally, but specifically, um, uh, Asia Edge is a whole of government effort, and there are, I think he said, eight uh, agencies of the U.S. government involved, of which I think Commerce is one. So I'm um, interested in what Commerce's interest is, what its role is, what its perspective is, how you see uh, this en energy and infrastructure story in, in this region. Great. Well, um, <coughs> thank you, Matthew, for having me, and thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, as you noted at the outset, I'm with the International Trade Administration at the Commerce Department. Um, just to give a very, very brief overview of our, our mission, basically, uh, at a high level, is to help create conditions for U.S. industry to innovate and compete globally. We do that in a variety of venues around the world. We work with companies across industries of all sizes. Um, and as I'm sure you've already heard this morning, and as Gloria just touched on, uh, increasingly for this administration, uh, one of the priority areas is, is the Indo-Pacific. It counts for... Uh, something on the order of two-thirds of all global trade, and that's only expected to increase in the coming years. Uh, so we really are uh, engaged heavily, as you just touched on, in an all-of-government effort uh, in that region. Um, I do think there's sometimes a lack of recognition um, about the level of private sector trade and investment in the region. Um, we have three bilateral agreements with Australia, Singapore, and Korea. We also have 14 trade and investment framework agreements in the region. Uh, last year alone, uh, we conducted nearly $2 trillion in two-way trade with nations in the region, uh, and our exports came to nearly $500 billion, again, just last year alone. So 
Um, we are also the largest source of investment for the region. Um, cumulative value of U.S. sourced FDI uh, reached uh, nearly a trillion dollars, and that's nearly double what it was just 10 years ago. So again, the region is uh, extremely vital, uh, strategically and economically. Uh, and I guess the administration's vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific is basically rooted in respect for sovereignty, for free, fair, reciprocal trade, for transparent governance, uh, and for private sector-led uh, economic growth. I think on that last point, that's a big part of commerce's role. We believe uh, that time and time again, market-driven policies in the development space have proven to be the most effective, uh, and that's why we're collaborating with other governments in the region to promote more open and transparent environments that can attract private sector capital. And that's a win-win for everybody. It's a win-win for the nations uh, in the region, um, and it's a win-win, quite frankly, for, for U.S. industry and workers in terms of the opportunities it affords. So um, I'm going to skip ahead a bit. You know, there's already a huge demand in the region, um, you know, alluding back to the numbers I just cited uh, for U.S. exports across the region. And there's, again, a variety of sectors, healthcare, aerospace and defense, energy and ICT. Uh, but there are still <coughs> tremendous additional opportunities that we're focused on across the region. Uh, there was an International Energy Agency report saying the Indo-Pacific is going to account for 60% uh, of the total global increase in primary energy demand by 2040. Uh, the Asian Development Bank has said that this demand is going to require over a trillion dollars in energy infrastructure investment annually, and that's just in the developing countries in the region alone. Uh, and I think the U.S. is very well positioned um, to use its resources, its technological <coughs> capabilities, to really address a lot of these challenges and opportunities. Uh, we're the lar largest producer of oil and gas in the world. Uh, we're leading developer of energy technology, and we're a leading innovator, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in advanced energy systems. And that's, that's smart grids, that's energy storage, that's renewable energy and fuels, among others. So uh, on the flip side, there are, of course, um, a number of remaining significant trade barriers in place. And, that also is where we spend a lot of our effort and energy um, trying to prevent, mitigate, and eliminate those barriers to make it easier, again, for U.S. industry, but also, frankly, so that the countries can benefit as well. Again, it's a win-win. Um, we do a lot of work in a lot of different ways on addressing barriers. Um, in addition to just preventing them at the outset, we negotiate, uh, obviously, trade agreements and trade deals. Uh, we ensure compliance with trade laws, and we look, again, to expand trade and investment opportunities across the region. Um, specifically with regard to Indo-Pacific uh, and Asia Edge, we are, our office in ITA is at the forefront, and just at a very high level, uh, to summarize some of the work we do on the initiative, I'll, I'll highlight four primary objectives that we have. Um, again, that's to mobilize private sector investment, promote exports from the United States, uh, remove the trade barriers, uh, and to strengthen standards and really uh, promote best value procurement practices across the region. Um, I guess in terms of the look ahead uh, for Asia Edge's next year, we're engaged uh, in a, a wide variety of activities, and I'll highlight just a few for you to give you a sense and a flavor of what Commerce is doing. Um, we're going to lead the first Asia Edge specific trade mission in March. I think it's March 16th to 20th. Uh, in 2020, uh, and the, the delegation is going to go to Vietnam, to Indonesia, and I think there's an optional spinoff for Thailand as well. Um, we got a lot of feedback uh, in addition from industry uh, and have developed a model for the private sector to participate in the initiative. Uh, this is the Energy Industry Working Group Network, uh, and it is basically a one-stop shop for the private sector to participate in our interagency programs. You mentioned the eight departments that are at the table on this, uh, and really help connect them with regional market opportunities uh, related to Asia Edge. Um, Access Asia, that's another uh, element that I do want to cite. Um, in 2019, uh, we took our Access Asia program to the next level by developing some, some really tailor-made trade promotion activities for U.S. companies uh, in these markets. Uh, to help companies really get access to commercial opportunities on the ground. So this is in addition to our already ongoing outreach in the U.S., but again, it's very specifically targeted at Asia Edge. So 
again, it's a whole of government effort, um, but I hope I highlighted just at least some of what we're doing at Commerce to help promote Great. that. Great. No, you've covered a lot of, uh, a lot of um, ground, and, and uh, again, I want to follow up in, in a second. But um, Komoto-san, let me ask you, um, uh, I, I want to ask you sort of broadly about Japan's um, approach and, and perspective on, on energy investment infrastructure as well in the, in the region. But, but there's a sort of a, a more immediate question I have about the G20, because uh, we had a big event yesterday on the sort of debriefing on the G20 in Osaka uh, late last month, and uh, co the talk about covering a lot of ground, uh, the G20 communique covers about 100 issues, but there's a significant um, section on energy, um, and just curious, how did, could you just explain briefly what that outcome was and why it's significant and what Japan intends to do with that to take it forward? Sure. Uh, thank you, Matthew, and thank you, CSIS, for having me with this thing as panelists. So uh, thank you very much for your question on G20, because we did a lot uh, this year. <laughs> thank you. So to your question, so, but before, um, every country faces environment, <coughs> a different um, uh, energy environment. But what is common to all of us, that we need to provide our people a stable and economical supply of energy. So to that end, one, we should not rely on a specific uh, energy resource, but rather diversify. Second, we should not rely on a specific energy procurement source geographically, uh, but rather diversify. And three, we should transform energy into electric power and supply it to p our people in a stable and economical manner. And lastly, in addition today, we need to <coughs> uh, advance energy transformation, in other words, decarbonization, to address the, our great challenge uh, of climate change. So throughout the G20 energy process, Japan shared with other members, uh, G20 members, the policy Japan takes to address the issues that, that I just laid out, uh, which, are called, which we call uh, S plus three E's. S stands for safety, in particular, after the Fukushima incident, safety is the top priority for Japan. Mm -hmm. And three E's uh, stands for uh, uh, three E's stand for uh, energy security, economic efficiency, and adapting to environment. <coughs> and with that common sort of foundation of discussion, uh, G20 energy and environmental ministers got together in Japan on June 15th and 16th. And they discussed and issued a communique and an action plan. G20 members got together to issue a common message of 20 on a very important issue of this energy and environment, which is not always easy to face. So let me give you some uh, details. Uh, most importantly, G20 uh, minute members agreed that innovation is one of the keys to overcome the great challenge on energy and advance the energy transition. <coughs> This includes innovations in the areas of developing new uh, energy resources, such as renewable energy and hydrogen energy, as well as upgrading and improving efficiency of conventional fossil fuels and nuclear energy. We also call for innovation in the areas of uh, like CCUS, uh, carbon capture utilization and storage, or <coughs> uh, and demand management and market system reform of electric power. And obviously, digital, digitalization will play a key role, critical role, uh, in making this happen. So G20 members agree we should make our utmost effort on innovation to address the challenges and advance uh, our path towards energy transition. So in particular, one of our focuses was on hydrogen energy. Uh, it was the first time for the G20 members to discuss in depth and agreed to substantive uh, text language in our joint statement. And taking advantage of this opportunity of G20, Japan, US, and EU uh, signed a joint statement on our future uh, cooperation in this uh, hydrogen energy area. On LNG, which is a hot and maybe the hottest topic in this uh, energy community, we agree to the importance of open, transparent, competitive, and stable market. As the biggest importer of LNG in the world, Japan would like to see LNG market expand as G20 ministers agree. And since we're 
And since the meeting took place right after the incident in the Strait of, uh, of Hormuz, energy security was also an important discussion item. And infrastructure uh, was also discussed in the context of security, uh, of energy security. Energy ministers <coughs> uh, confirmed the importance of high quality infrastructure for a sustainable and resilient energy system in the long run, in particular in the long run, as finance ministers also uh, agreed and put out uh, guiding principles in their ministerial meeting in early June. And lastly, I think everybody will agree that a statement won't mean anything unless there is an action followed. So uh, we put together an action plan that will encourage members to implement all the good things that we agreed to. When we, and then we asked the members to register their policies and practices and their method uh, and measures to share them with other members. And IEA will follow, up, follow them up next year and will further promote this uh, sharing of best practices and cooperation in areas possible among members. So as a responsible chair of G20 this year, 2019, Japan is committed to take actions uh, with other G20 members, of course, as well as other members uh, in the world, and to lead the energy transition for the next generation. Excellent, thank you. Good uh, coverage of, the, um, of a broad set of important issues, and I want to again come back on that. But Mr. Wynn, let me ask you, um, so Japan is um, you know, the, most, uh, the biggest, as you said, importer of LNG, sort of more broadly. Uh, big, uh, one of the world's biggest established uh, demanders of, of energy. Vietnam is one of the fastest growing um, new uh, demanders of energy. Right. You're also a producer of energy, so um, in an interesting position in this, in this story. How does Vietnam perceive the, um, the regional uh, energy uh, investment story and, and what are you doing to promote uh, energy? All of the objectives that Mr. Komoto just laid out, energy security, efficiency, all the rest. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Matt, and thank you, CSS and uh, State Department for organizing this. It's a very significant event. I think I can share with most of the points raised by our colleagues from Japan and uh, our West, USA uh, support in this effort. I think that uh, first I would like to mention a little about our, our demands for energy in Vietnam and what we have, uh, have done with the US and other partners in the region to promote this cooperation. I think that um, as a country of uh, nearly 100 million people and uh, GDP growth rate uh, annually is reach around 6.5 to 7 percent a year, I think the, there is great demand for, for energy in Vietnam. We estimate that our power generation uh, should triple from now on until uh, 2030s. Currently our power generation uh, reach around uh, 47,000 megawatt a year, and it could reach uh, 60,000 next year, 2020, and it will reach 130 100 megawatt uh, by 2030. And uh, our uh, expert also uh, estimates that we need around 150 billion of US dollar of investment in energy and power investment in the coming decade. So I think that uh, and, um, regional cooperation is very significant in this effort. We, 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 work, we can work with um, the other partners in developing the new sources of energy in Vietnam. Currently in our energy structure, the, the hydropower and coal-fired power plants account for our 75 to 80 percent of our power uh, generation and more than 20% comes from natural gas and other resources. And in our renewed plan of development of power, we are looking for more sources from renewable uh, sources and LNG. And I think not only Vietnam, Southeast Asia, as our, our colleague said, is now a big consumer of LNG. We think that LNG and renewable uh, sources will be a big uh, investment for Vietnam in the coming years. So I think that uh, the regional cooperation is very, very important, and especially the role of the U.S. Uh, cooperation and businesses and government commitment is very important too, uh, at, the, at least for Vietnam in four aspects. The first is to diversify our power and energy supply, our power connectivity with the regional countries, 
And the third point is to support our, us in the maintaining our energy security. Yeah, because we don't want to rely much on one or two source of energy or one or two partners. We want to diversify. So in case the regional or international economies or price or oil gas have fluctuation, we, our economic development will not be much affected. The third point, we would like to cooperate with the regional partners, especially the U.S., with high technologies in promote the energy savings and efficiency. And the last point we can work is the technology. We think that in the new change of appliances, which use uh, smart uh, electricity, smart vehicles, we think that when we work with the big partners like the U.S. Corporation, we can adapt the new technologies in our, our grid system or even in our use of energies. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Very, Thank very you. in line with G20. That's right. I, not, I noted that. I noted Our partner also joined the G20. Meeting. That's right. Vietnam was there, actually. They're not a regular member of the G20, but they were in Osaka. So that's right. Um, uh, thank you so much. Mr. Chawla, um, uh, similar question. In India is also a big uh, demander of energy and a growing one as well. Um, what's your perspective on, on this story on energy and uh, infrastructure investment across the region and the role for cooperation among yeah. the players at the table here? Uh, thank you, Matt. <clears throat> I'll first uh, say a few, uh, summarize a few interesting facts about India's energy scenario. And then uh, I'll touch upon the Indo-US Strategic Energy Partnership and how we are collaborating with uh, the United States in this direction. Uh, <clears throat> India, you know, if you look at international data from the International Energy Agency, uh, India imports about one third of its primary energy needs. And it imports 80% of its oil and gas requirements. Uh, which essentially means it's not necessarily a bad thing to import energy from abroad, but it places a lot of discipline on you. It places constraints on you, and the constraints can work for the better. The International Trade Administrator is here. Uh, let me reveal a trade secret. People in my profession, economists, they love churn out figures where denominator explodes with time, so it looks better. Let me do exactly the opposite. In 1990, if you divide the CO2 emissions by India's GDP, in 2010 US dollars, which means we are fixing the denominator in real terms, and we are also treating numerator in real terms. So emission intensity of India's economy was 1.13 kg CO2 in 1990. And fixing the 2010 US dollars, not allowing it to increase nominally, not even allowing for the change in the value of rupee, which will bloat up the denominator. In 2016, and this is independent data, this intensity had come down to 0.84 kg CO2 for India's GDP in 2010 US dollars, mm -hmm. which means the real intensity of India's economy from 1990 to 2016, which is about 26 years, came down by 25% in real terms. And over this period, India developed rapidly. India brought down absolute poverty from 50% to now 10%. At that time, most of the households in India did not have access to electricity. Today, every village is connected with electricity. Today, all villages have road connectivity, infrastructure. And from a low-income country, India is now a low-middle-income country. So it's broken into that bracket. 
And going forward, uh, India's energy needs would increase rapidly as India would go on to become a 5 trillion and then a 10 trillion economy. And the International Energy Agency uh, estimates that going forward up to 2040, a one third of the global energy supply or energy demand would actually come from India. This is a great opportunity and also a great responsibility. We take, uh, India takes not just his energy economy, but also its international obligations very seriously. We've undertaken to bring down the emission intensity of our GDP intensity by 33 to 35 percent by 2030 over 2005 levels. We've undertaken to increase non-fossil based electricity capacity to 40% by 2030. And I'm happy to tell you we've already reached 33%. We've undertaken to create an additional carbon sink of 3 billion tons of CO2 in terms of additional forest stock. And with a huge and growing population, in spite of that, India's forest stock and forest and tree cover is growing. This also brings into effect the geopolitics of coal and the geopolitics of oil and how it's going to play out going forward. We are becoming increasingly responsible in the use of coal. We are replacing old power plants with supercritical and critical supercritical technology. And the United States is helping us with that because we have a strategic energy partnership with the, with the US. In terms of oil and gas, the story is even better. We want to diversify our oil and gas supplies, particularly because we are hugely import dependent. We have very little oil and gas of our own. Uh, we have undertaken long-term contracts for 20 years to buy $2 billion of uh, the US gas every year. And under the Strategic Energy Partnership, uh, we are working together with the United States and setting up gas infrastructure, gas markets, gas regulatory systems in India. Last year, I mean, three, two, three years ago, we never imported any oil from the US. In 2018, we imported $48 billion, 48 billion barrels of oil in 2018. And if the current trends are to be believed, this year, we might be importing 100 million barrels of oil from the United States. So in dollar terms, a trade which was near zero two to three years ago is going to reach $8 billion this year. It will help solve the trade deficit problem as well. Uh, with these few words, I'll now uh, hand over to the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chella. So you actually anticipated the, the question I want to kind of use the rest of our time before getting the audience involved in to get everybody in, in, involved in answering, which is what do you want from the United States to the three gentlemen in the middle uh, and then to the, to the American officials um, uh, on the edges of, of this, of, of, of our foreign guests? Um, what are you offering that is unique and special. Sarah asked a similar question of, of Senator Gardner and, and Assistant Secretary Fannin about, you know, there's some skepticism because the U.S. doesn't have a trillion dollars or four trillion dollars or whatever China's offering in, yeah. in its Belt and Road Initiative and others, um, but, but what do we actually bring to the table? So before you to answer that from your perspective, I'd be interested, um, yeah. maybe Mr. Mr. Wynn, maybe why don't we start with you actually. What, what does Vietnam really see the U.S. as bringing 
to this story in, in energy? What, what is it particularly that you want from the United States and feel the United States has a unique uh, uh, advantage to offer uh, to you in the energy and infrastructure yes. uh, area? Yes, thank you, Matt. I think that uh, the U.S. and other partners can bring a lot of um, advantages to Vietnam in energy and infrastructure development. And I think that um, I think that we can mention at least three aspects. I think uh, first uh, regarding the financing and uh, uh, the partnership between uh, public and private, and the role of techno technology in development in our cooperation. In terms of financing, I think that um, currently uh, in Vietnam we we have a, uh, a ceiling of national debt of 65 percent of our GDP. And currently, the, this, uh, the rate of national debt is nearing this cap. So in the coming years, we are trying to have more private investment in uh, energy and infrastructure development. And I think, as just mentioned, it costs uh, hundreds of uh, billions of US dollars in the coming decade. So I think that um, uh, we, when we heard about the OPEC and the new change into IDFC, plans to have more funding for uh, regional development, I think it's a very good chance for our cooperation. Because when we have more uh, investment and financing from private sectors, we will have not only more resources, but uh, we have more mani mani management skills in uh, mobilizing funding and to save the cost of our investment. Because the uh, private sector is very smart in the investment we can take advantage of the investment in the energy sector. Uh, recently, an, an, another aspect is our uh, management and uh, to in de develop the market, power and energy market in Vietnam. We recently have a pilot project with USAID in uh, set up a mechanism we call the Renewable Energy Direct per uh, Power Purchase uh, Agreement. DDPA. Mm -hmm. uh, this mechanism uh, which will allow uh, the big consumer of electricity, electricity in Vietnam like Samsung or Nike or Coca-Cola, they have the direct uh, engagement with the renewable energy uh, developers on the private sectors. So when they have the direct uh, contract with each other, they can provide the best service of electric uh, power to, to the, the consumers. So I think it's a very good uh, uh, model of cooperation between private and private and public and private sectors. The second thing we can count on uh, big cooperation or big uh, partners like U.S. is uh, your uh, high and advanced technologies in uh, energy and infrastructures. For example, regarding the natural gas. Uh, recently, uh, over the past 30 years, Vietnam uh, worked with other partners, including Russia, and U.S. in developing, and India, in developing the oil refineries, uh, ga gas, and rich in uh, offshores of uh, Vietnam uh, seas. But uh, in the future, we ha need to more have more drilling in the deep sea waters. So the big corporation like uh, ExxonMobil, or IES, or Murphy Oil Corporation, and uh, presence in Vietnam offshore and coastal area is very important for our energy security. It can diversify our uh, power supplies as well as to have more cooperation and especially to use the technological development in uh, making full use of this oil fuels. And the thing, another important is uh, regarding the, the techno technology application in, um, in developing the transmission grid of the power in Vietnam. Currently, we, we, we calculate that it takes around five to three years to develop or to build up a new transmission grid of power in Vietnam. But it takes only six months for a new solar power uh, uh, facility to be set up. So when they are over the past six months, there are over 70 uh, solar, w solar or wind uh, power plants in Vietnam to be set up. So it will be a big demand for the development of transmission grid. So I think that when we work with the uh, U.S. partners, 
we can develop more infrastructures in not only in transmission grid but also in the terminal to import and export uh, and kind of distribution of LNG in Vietnam. Currently, Vietnam is working with the AES Corporation in, build up, in building up a new LNG terminal in the south to uh, provide a good facility for import of LNG and distribute to the consumers. Okay. And the last point is that when we work with the U.S. and other partners, we can use uh, develop the high quality infrastructure like our Chinese partner said, and uh, we can make full use of their uh, partnership with our private partners in Vietnam to provide more uh, funding and uh, technology and even the human resources capacity building for our lo our local uh, developers because our human resource uh, in the area of infrastructure and electricity is still now lacking. We need more resource and human resource in this area. Excellent. Thank you. Well, that's quite a, quite a menu uh, <laughs> of, of, of things that, that, that you need. Excellent. Uh, Mr. Chala, yeah, you want the energy because the U.S., you said, is going to supply that, and that's win-win because it helps with the trade imbalance, which we won't get into uh, in this <laughs> panel, but, but maybe in others. Um, uh, but, but what else? If you had one or two other things briefly, yeah. what would you want from the U.S. in particular? Yeah. Very briefly. Uh, our relationship with the United States in the energy sector is largely driven by the private sector. And uh, India, as I mentioned, has very little onshore oil and gas. But there is still unexploited potential in the offshore area, in the exclusive economic zone. And we have been experimenting with policy and evolving it. So we learned some lessons from the past. And we have now evolved a regime which we call HELP. HELP Is that means an acronym? seeking help. Oh, okay. So it does not, and not just seeking help, but it means uh, harmonize exploration and licensing policy. And uh, under this policy, we are now uh, coming to a simpler, just a revenue sharing framework. Uh, there are still some issues we are in talk with the US private sector companies, and we're trying to. Uh, you know, uh, adjust to uh, international requirements. So going forward in future, uh, we would see investment coming into uh, the offshore oil and gas area. Secondly, a lot of investment is coming into India in the gas, LNG gas infrastructure, in the form of terminals, in the form of gas pipelines, in the form of infrastructure. And it's not just oil and gas producers in U.S., but it's also the companies which liquefy, which transport, which bring it back. And it's creating a very nice, I would say, strategic energy collaboration uh, with U.S. And we are also working with the, uh, my friends and partners who you know, uh, are on the dais. We are all on the same page. So Great. thumbs up. Excellent. Okay. So Komoto-san, a slightly different, you know, variation on the same question because obviously yeah. Japan is, is an established uh, advanced country, not an emerging country that needs that kind of help from the United States. But what do you, what do you want in terms of uh, support, help with energy uh, integration, energy development, um, infrastructure development in the region from the U.S.? Mm -hmm. So uh, let me share with you what we are working with the United States in this uh, energy. Um, <coughs> our colleague from uh, India mentioned about the partnership, but Japan also have uh, this uh, Japan-U.S. strategic energy partnership we call JUSEP uh, with Japan uh, with the United States. And <coughs> uh, basically, this is to uh, ensure secure, uh, uh, secure, reliable, and resilient energy supplies in the region under a shared vision of free and open in the Pacific. And it was launched by uh, Prime Minister Abe and President Trump in November 2017. And so basically under this uh, initiative, all the agencies on both sides get together. This is quite difficult, but we're doing it uh, together and uh, work jointly how we can achieve our goal. So, and there are many things on the table, but one of the focus is about creating LNG market in the region and around the world. Uh, Obviously, as our colleagues from uh, Vietnam and India uh, mentioned, LNG is growing in the region, but we need a more sort of flexible, transparent uh, market. 
And U.S. is a huge supplier of LNG today, as we all know. Japan is the biggest importer, and we have a, a lot of experience in uh, <coughs> building and operating LNG facilities. So there are a lot of things that we can work together and complement with each other. And in terms of finance, Japan has, uh, public, has public funding to finance energy-related projects, not only in Japan, but also uh, in, uh, abroad. JBIC, JICA, NEXI, JOGMAC, if you know, uh, are the government institutions that can play a big role in this energy-related project. JBIC, JICA, NEXI have a memorandum of cooperation with OPIC uh, of the United States, and I see some JICA people, uh, colleagues in this room. So, uh, but the cooperation between Japan and the U.S. does not stop here, meaning finance. We are also doing technical assistance. Uh, if you were to build and uh, operate LNG plants, you would want a uh, legal framework of PPP, pro uh, public private partnership, for example, and then you would want uh, people who can build and operate these huge facilities with a uh, uh, high level of expertise. So uh, Japan and the US are working together in this uh, technical assistance, uh, human resource. And lastly, uh, speaking of uh, investment, I touched upon a little bit earlier about quality infrastructure. Uh, so in response to this rapid, uh, recent rapid growth of infrastructure needs in the region, we see many projects in Asia, but we also see quite a few low quality uh, infrastructure with problems which developing countries uh, are suffering with after the completion of these projects and facilities. So Japan, as a member and a partner of Asia, we would like to see investments in the region that are consistent with the development goals of the region, creating jobs in the regions, and taking into account its life cycle costs and its uh, social and environmental sustainability. So this is the idea of high quality infrastructure that Japan has been advocating um, and has led the initiative in, for example, in APEC that led to putting together the guidebook on uh, infrastructure, quality infrastructure development investment. And we also <coughs> uh, asked G20 finance ministers to discuss and they have come up with G20 uh, guiding principles for quality infrastructure develop, uh, investment last month. So Japan and the U US, uh, now Australia is joining us, uh, can work together to promote this idea of quality infrastructure for the region, and we hope that we can deliver uh, concrete, deliverable outcomes in the months and years to come. Right, and those, those infrastructure principles are very uh, important, and, and the leaders uh, at the Osaka summit um, endorsed uh, those principles, and I know Japan and the U.S. were very instrumental in, in moving those forward. So that was uh, uh, that was a great accomplishment. So, so Jim and Gloria, in that order, um, can you provide all of that? Uh, I mean, <laughs> um, of course. The, the um, you know, seriously, the, we're celebrating the, the one-year anniversary of, of the Indo-Pacific Strategy, um, Pon uh, Secretary Pompeo's speech, and, and, you know, it was at the time there was some scrutiny and criticism given to the fact that only $113 million, that's a million with an M, mm -hmm. was, was allocated for this across all of these different initiatives. That's not a lot of money. Um, is, that what a, is, is that a legitimate criticism, or is there, uh, is there something else we're bringing that is helping to address? Uh, these, these uh, needs? Uh, so it's undoubtedly the latter. Um, we're not going to out China China by just throwing money at everything, I think. Um, we've already heard a lot of specific examples of uh, perhaps what the U.S. can offer. Um, so maybe I'll just put it into some buckets to sort of create some, some categories. At, at a high level, I think what the U.S. government can offer, you know, as I touched on earlier, um, you know, promoting policies, um, development policies that are open, that are transparent, that are rules-based. Again, what that does is helps put, particularly developing countries, obviously, in a position to create environments that it's going to attract you know, the capital, the investment for them to go on to build um, you know, the development, the infrastructure projects, what have you, um, in a way that's actually going to lead to um, high quality projects that are affordable and that are sustainable. I think you know, we've seen some cautionary tales now with China, you know, Sri Lanka and this whole concept of, of debt trap diplomacy, um, obviously the lack of transparency that comes um, with that sort of dynamic where they just throw these massive amounts of money 
uh, you know, this is purely anecdotal, but in my travels we hear a lot about projects that ultimately turn out to be subpar in the extreme, mm -hmm. and that you know they end up having to rebuild something two years later. So, beyond you know what we can offer at a policy level, you know we're working a lot on um, again with with developing countries to shore up policies related to corruption um, on um, a variety of different policy issues, but also. Like Japan and other countries, we have world-class companies. Um, and I think a lot of our policies benefit from the fact that they are informed, not just by industry. We have other stakeholders that, that should be at the table and are at the table. But we get the benefit of, you know, we're not developing policy in the abstract. We're actually hearing from people on the ground who understand the issues. And again, it's got to be balanced. It's not exclusively industry. Um, but they're deep, and we have deep expertise at the industry level, we have, I think, policies that are very well informed generally um, in terms of what they're trying to achieve. And I think I've been a little surprised in my role over the last two years. That's not always the case in a lot of places around the world. And that's not specific to the Indo-Pacific. I, I think in some places there's a, a deeper suspicion of, of industry. But um, I think our model since World War II is we're looking for partnerships. We're not looking for, again, sort of a debt trap diplomacy type dynamic. And I think it, you want to win-win and, and you want the situation to be mutually beneficial. So again, I think that's why we're engaged in these dialogues and, and we're talking about collaboration um, with, with partners as opposed to perhaps the other dynamic that we sometimes talk about. So that was very high level because I think we got very specific about a lot of the issues, but I think that sort of dovetails well. Cause Great. Excellent. A lot no, of productive you, you, you engagements go, going on. You did go through some of the specifics in your, in your first um, uh, opening statement, so uh, appreciate that. Gloria, briefly, yeah, just I, I want to give the audience at least one it quick It isn't, uh, what, we, what we bring isn't the 100, whatever, 143 million dollars that was allowed. We bring the whole of government, the whole of U.S. government in, uh, at the table and uh, the expertise that we bring. At the same time, we bring the U.S. companies at the table and the innovation, the creativity and, uh, that, they, they, that, uh, that, uh, that they bring to the table. It's quite different, really. And, um, and then we also bring other donors together. And so it, isn't, uh, it is not just one thing that we bring. But the most important thing I think uh, Jim has talked about is the value. American value of creating sustainable, a sustainable self-reliant development in the countries. We, we, work, we work with the countries to develop policies that will be able to make them self-reliant, not dependent, not totally in debt. We also, when we bring projects, we, use, we make sure that we use labor that is available in the countries. Um, uh, some other country that you mentioned bring their own labor and therefore does not create employment uh, in the countries where they work. So in short, uh, I, I think we can respond to all the, all the needs. We bring all of government, all of our businesses uh, in the United States, and all of like-minded partners at the table in each of the country where we work, working with them to help them get in a long-term self-reliant uh, uh, journey rather than a short-term debt trap that some others. Some others. Uh, we we'll, we'll we'll remain nameless. Okay. Right. Um, all right. Um, thanks so much. The authorities have told me I can buy five minutes um, of, uh, of, of time to let uh, maybe three questions be asked in a cluster, and then we'll um, we'll um, we'll try and get through those, and then and then let the next panel um, uh, enlighten you further. So, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, there are microphones. Identify yourself and ask a brief question. Um, as I say, I'll take a cluster. Who's the brave person? Who's gonna who's gonna go first? Um, all right. There's somebody right there. Is there anybody over here? I'm trying to look as far afield as I can. Okay. There's a gentleman there, and then a third hand. And way in the back there. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Seth Rose, Anarif Institute. Uh, if you could um, briefly, and I guess maybe um, Mr. Komoto, um, be interesting to hear your perception on the on the demand side versus the supply side. Obviously, you know, with uh, your technology leader in the region and. India and, and, and Vietnam are, are exponentially growing and they need that for their economic development. But at the same time, I'm wondering, you know, how much of the thought goes into efficiency on the, on the demand side versus 
uh, the, the energy and thought into the supply side. Okay, uh, efficiency, demand side efficiency. Okay, uh, and I forgot who I called on next. I know, there he is, okay. Uh, Atarv Gupta, Georgetown University. I'm wondering if any of you see a market for nuclear energy in Asia, and if so, is that, if that's something that the United States is interested in pursuing. Okay, good, good, short, clear question. Uh, and then the gentleman back there. Yep. Uh, Murad Said Ahmedov, Eurasia Foundation. I have a uh, question to I'm not sure. Can you pull the, uh, turn the microphone toward, <laughs> towards you? Uh, rep to the representatives of Vietnam in India about uh, development of nuclear power plants in their countries because of uh, India closely works with Rosatom and they, I think, building Kunam nuclear power plant, whereas Vietnam, I think, they canceled the deal about uh, how they see respectively uh, develop a nuclear power plant in their country. Okay, so we have a pair of nuclear questions for the Indian and Vietnamese um, colleagues about your development on that side and Komoto-san on efficiency. Uh, um, on efficiency. Um, and then whoever wants to perhaps talk about the U.S. supply of of nuclear. Okay. Um, I, I actually didn't hear the second question very well. The second question, second the, question. The second question that was about whether there are opportunities for in, in the nuclear, nuclear. Um, uh, energy sector for the U.S. Um, and are we interested in pursuing those yeah. uh, those I I issues? But let's start with the efficiency question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your question. Um, let question me start uh, with the statistics in care. Japan. <laughs> Japan is a country with a very low self-sufficiency uh, ratio, energy sufficiency ratio. Um, <clears throat> uh, we went down to 6% after the Fukushima incident. And now we have, it has risen a bit r recently, but still at the level of 10%. For, uh, for, for your information, for example, US self-sufficiency ratio is about 93%. Mm -hmm. Canada, 174%. 10%, Japan is one of the very low, lowest uh, countries, uh, even in uh, OECD countries. So we depend a lot on uh, countries' abro energy abroad. So we are quite desperate in terms of this efficiency. So we are very aware. So in, in Japan, we've been always um, uh, doing reform, regulatory, ref including regulatory reforms um, on demand management and also the, uh, mar uh, uh, the generation uh, distribution and re uh, retail uh, reforms. So we are very aware of this uh, uh, a very um, important issue on uh, demand side efficiency. So that is why we have also discussed this in G20 ministerial meetings on this um, man demand management and, um, uh, and the uh, uh, market reform of, in particular, the electric uh, power uh, market. Okay, thanks, Mr. Chawla. On yep. we'll start with the third question and, and yep. India's I'll, perspective uh, on nuclear. First, very quickly, the collaboration on nuclear energy between India and United States. Uh, we are setting up. Uh, India and U.S. entered into a civil nuclear uh, deal about uh, 12, 13 years ago, and we are setting up a Westinghouse plant, which is based on the cutting edge uh, technology, the reactor, which has been developed in United States. Uh, there were some hiccups in between because of the financial problems which the group went into, but they've now been sorted out and we're working together to put together a collaboration in place which takes it forward. Uh, on the demand side, uh, we take demand side efficiency very seriously, and uh, which is how we have achieved in real terms what I mentioned uh, during my comments briefly. Uh, but to summarize it, the demand side of energy lies in industry and the households. And we have uh, different policy frameworks for both. Uh, for households, it's uh, the, sh the building shell as well as the appliances. And we have different programs for both. Uh, we still have to build up most of our commercial space, which gives us the opportunity. So we have star rating standards for uh, commercial buildings, which are energy guzzlers to achieve. And in terms of appliances, we have ratings. We have, uh, in fact, now launched a formal program that even an electricity going to a rural household for the first time, we have a program for bringing them LED bulbs. So straight, no electricity to LED. Then in terms of primary energy supply, uh, 
for years and years, biomass was burned in Indian homes in rural areas. Uh, in the last five years, the government has launched a path-breaking program to take uh, natural gas as a clean cooking food fuel to uh, all rural households. Uh, for industry, we have uh, on one side not just the pollution control, but also now energy efficiency programs. And, uh, you know, uh, people have evolved more complex mechanisms like cap and trade, markets. So intellectually constrained people like me do simple things. So we imposed what is called a, our own version of carbon tax, which is called the coal cess. And we imposed, uh, we started with $1 per ton, but today it is 400 rupees, which is almost $7 per ton. And this is giving us a resource which goes into a separate fund. And this fund is then deployed into energy efficient efforts across the economy. Thank okay. you. Okay, excellent. So 30 seconds each uh, <laughs> for Mr. Wynn. Is, is, is nuclear part of the energy strategy of Vietnam? How does nuclear energy fit into your strategy? And Jim, maybe what's the US opportunity here? Yes, very, very short. Uh, uh, in the past 10 years ago, we also have a um, plan for nuclear power in Vietnam. But after the incident in, in Japan, Japan. This, you know, we, we cancel it. And we now turn to renewable energies and uh, LNG, as I mentioned earlier. And I think that this will be a win-win cooperation for, between Vietnam and the US and other partners. For Vietnam, we have more energy sources, diversified uh, technologies. For the US, we will have the more investment in the region and the success of the IPS. And especially when we have a trade uh, balance with the US, when we have the energy cooperation, we will improve the trade balance with the US. And the third point is as, uh, we will be the ASEAN chair next year, 2020. We will work with ASEAN partners to promote this cooperation in energy and power to have more regional engagement with the US in this area. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Jim. So my 30 se second response. Um, U.S. civil nuclear industry is among the most competitive and advanced in the world. I like just mentioned Westinghouse. Um, it is definitely part of the mix. I will say um, we are part of an interagency group on civil nuclear. The State Department, the Department of Energy are, are very much at the table. And we have a very tight regime that governs um, how those deals and those exports operate, the one, two, three agreements. But you know, we're very... Um, aggressive, I guess, about making sure that when we are exporting products in this particular space, we are also exporting our state-of-the-art safety regime and protocols, et cetera, et cetera. So um, again, we're at the table with, with other departments, so we're not the lead, but it is most definitely um, civil nuclear is in the mix in terms of, of the energy strategy. Okay, excellent. There's so much more to cover, but we've covered a lot of ground and we are, uh, sorry, way Sarah, past. Uh, way past even my five-minute uh, extension, but thank you for the indulgence. So uh, please join me in, in thanking this great panel. For their Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we will scoot off, and the next panel, I think, is invited to come up. Rest, um, so, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah.
people just ask, ask the right questions. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Nico Safos, and I'm a senior fellow with the Energy and National Security Program here at CSIS. And uh, thank you first for sticking around. This is the uh, concluding act of uh, this, uh, this morning's uh, event. And I'm, I'm really excited about this panel because we're going to have a, a great diversity of, of perspectives to really add to the conversations we had uh, in the first two, uh, two panels. Um, we have uh, five speakers, so I'm not going to read their bios because that will mostly get us to run out of time. Um, but uh, very quickly, uh, right next to me is Dave Turk. Uh, he was with the International Energy Agency. Uh, Todd Arajano with the U.S. Trade and Development Agency. Uh, Clay Nestler with uh, Johnson Controls. Uh, Tommy Joyce with the Department of Energy. And uh, Kari Coffin with Chenier Energy. So we have a great mix of uh, multilateral U.S. government, private sector, U.S. government, private sector. So we're going to have a really uh, fun conversation uh, talking about this, this region. So the first thing I wanted to do is start with you, uh, Dave. And um, both of the previous panels referenced um, the International Energy Agency and its projections about uh, this region, the growth that we expect in terms of energy consumption in the region. Uh, so let me ask you to defend yourself. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about how the International Energy Agency sees this region, both in terms of overall consumption, but maybe also some of the fuel trends and, and other uh, important signposts that you think are useful for us to understand. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Nikos, and uh, thanks for CSIS hosting this, uh, what's been a terrific event so far. Hopefully, uh, my colleagues and I won't let you down with the concluding uh, panel. It should be a terrific discussion. Um, so uh, happy to get into some of the additional numbers, and it's always great to hear um, our IEA numbers uh, talked about by others. Like that's one of the things we uh, we hope that our our data and analysis is useful for a whole variety of uh, variety of actors, whether governments or uh, private sector as well. So one data point um, in terms of the importance of the uh, Indo-Pacific and the Asia region more generally is. Um, really where the IEA ourselves are going. The IEA is an organization which uh, relatively recently was basically an OECD group of countries, uh, advanced economies around the world. And a few years ago, we began our own modernization effort to really try to make sure the IEA was uh, built to purpose, not only for now, but going ahead. And so we started this association process um, where we're working with uh, a variety of other countries, especially major emerging countries that are uh, increasingly important, already important, increasingly important in the energy space. And so in the region, we've got in the Indo-Pacific region, India, Indonesia, Thailand, Singapore, uh, as association countries, and a lot of our own efforts focused, uh, focused in those countries, and happy to get into that as we get into the discussion today. So we uh, already heard about the 60% number our, uh, uh, from Assistant Secretary Fannin. We heard from our Indian colleague about the third of demand growth, energy demand growth, just coming from India to the 2040 time period. If you take a snapshot of where we're at on energy demand growth right now, in 2018, we had a 2.3% overall energy demand growth. 70% of that came from three countries. Uh, that was the US, that was China, that was India. So you certainly see the trends um, already there in terms of some of the bigger countries in Asia, um, but the trend's even shifting further to the region as a whole, Southeast Asia, India, of course, uh, whose numbers are incredibly impressive already in terms of demand growth and going forward. One data nugget there just on the demand growth on the India front, which I think just underscores the, what that really means in kind of real terms, something more tangible. So if you think of India just in electricity, so just talking of the electricity part of the energy equation, Right now, they already have a very sizable electricity grid. Uh, our, uh, when we look ahead two decades, uh, over the next two decade period of time, where is that going to go? Even under conservative assumptions, um, you would expect to have India add on to its grid a grid the size of Europe, the European Union, just in a two decade period of time. So that's the kind of uh, uh, what that really means in tangible terms. And you can pull out some other examples for different countries and, and, and regions as well. Uh, Access. Access is a big issue. It's a big issue in India. It's a big issue in some other countries uh, in the region. And we've seen incredibly impressive strides on that in, in recent time. Just to give you a few numbers, it, it was referenced a little bit uh, earlier. In India in 2000, 43% uh, of people in India had access to electricity. That number has grown all the way to 88% in 2017. So that's 17 years, that kind of growth, very impressive. Uh, government should be certainly uh, 
uh, and civil society and country uh, in, in India. Southeast Asia was 62%, so they started from a bit of a higher base there, uh, incredibly impressive growth to 90% in 2017, and the trajectories are, uh, are looking good going ahead to get to the universal electricity access for all the reasons, for education, for economic development, uh, et cetera, along those lines. Uh, efficiency is something we look at a lot, and a lot of these countries are, are frankly leaders in efficiency, and maybe Clay will get into this uh, a little bit further. The global average for efficiency improvements uh, was 1.3%, which is actually quite low. That's a disappointing number. Uh, it should be quite a bit higher than that. India, just to give you a, a counterpoint for India, was 3.1%. So 3.1% improvement in India and some of the other countries in the region also are experiencing um, some real uh, um, um, growth, if you will. Growth and efficiency improvement, so less, uh, less energy for, uh, for the GDP growth uh, along those lines. Happy to go fuel by fuel here on renewables. Uh, again, just to point out India, we had uh, 9.1 gigawatts of solar added in 2017, 9.6 gigawatts of solar added in 20, uh, 2018. Uh, Southeast Asia, frankly, some of the countries could do more. There's a huge solar resource, there's a huge resource more generally for renewables, and some countries aren't doing as well as they could be doing, should be doing, and there's a number of reasons. Maybe we'll get into that uh, in the panel, uh, in the panel uh, as well. So a few numbers there, happy to get into some other numbers if there's particular sectors or areas that uh, folks are interested in, but uh, uh, this region is big, it's only getting bigger and more important, uh, certainly in the energy sense. Well, thank you for that uh, framing, uh, framing comments, David. We're definitely going to come back on, I definitely want to talk about renewables uh, more and maybe also coal. Um, what I want to do now is go through the rest of the panel and um, the question is more or less the same. Talk to us about what your uh, company or organization or agency is doing in the region. How do you think about the region? What are the opportunities that you see? And we'll start with you, Todd. Uh, thank you, Nikos, and also thanks to CSIS for putting the forum together today. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with USTDA, U.S. Trade and Development Agency, uh, we are the early stage project preparation arm of the U.S. government. Uh, we have a dual, ma a dual mandate, which is unique, uh, the first of which being helping build large-scale infra infrastructure projects in emerging markets across the globe, and secondarily, increasing U.S. exports for U.S. industry. And so. Uh, that, that dual mandate gives us a unique positioning to be able to do the work that we do, especially within the Indo-Pacific region. So how do we do what we do? Um, first thing that we do and what we're known for are feasibility studies. Uh, we do feasibility studies all across the globe. We've done a number of them in the Indo-Pacific through the 27 years that we've been uh, a, a federal agency on our own independently. Uh, we do these feasibility studies to create bankable projects that can increase the energy security of the countries that we're partnering with, as well as provide affordable and efficient energy for the citizens of those countries. Uh, to give you an example of a recent feasibility study that we did, uh, I was in Hanoi just a couple of months ago in May to sign a $1.5 million grant with uh, Vietnam Electricity, which uh, is going to help them select a site for an LNG terminal, as well as help them with their gas to power production in southern Vietnam. Uh, and so that's just an example of the things that we do on the feasibility front. We also do technical assistance projects, uh, which can help with uh, legal and regulatory, regulatory reforms in the countries where we work. Uh, this is highly important, and we recently, uh, the executive committee of our agency recently supported uh, a workshop series throughout the Indo-Pacific region uh, to do standards and regulatory work in those countries as well. And then lastly, we do reverse trade missions and conferences, uh, where we bring buyers and procurement officials and other government officials uh, from the countries that we work with to the United States to showcase U.S. industry and technology solutions. Uh, it's, uh, it's an important thing. It builds relationships and it, and it really helps create free and open markets across the globe and specifically within the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, as I mentioned, we've been around for 27 years. We've done over 800 activities throughout the Indo-Pacific region which has accounted for over $15 billion worth of exports from the United States. Uh, what do we see within the region? Uh, lots of opportunity and lots of growth. Uh, so much so that within the agency, we're reallocating a lot of our resources specifically towards the Indo-Pacific region. And we're working a lot with our partners throughout the interagency of the U.S. government uh, to bring more resources into U.S. TDA to do more of the work that we're currently doing. Uh, lastly, let me talk about some of the work that we do with partner countries as well. Uh, last year in October, 
uh, myself and our acting director, Tom Hardy, went to Tokyo to work with the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry uh, in Japan. And we partnered with them. We signed a, a memorandum of cooperation with them in November 2017. And the first project that we did within that, uh, that memorandum was a dual sort of reverse trade mission where we brought uh, folks from Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam to Tokyo uh, to learn about LNG and, and, and all of the things that go with you know, building terminals and, and buying uh, LNG from foreign markets. And then uh, just last month in June, we brought a number of officials here to the United States as well. And uh, we actually took them down to uh, uh, Sabine Pass and, and showed them Chenier's facility as well. So across the board, uh, we are doing a number of different things to promote uh, increased energy efficiency, increased energy security all throughout the Indo-Pacific region, and uh, we're, we're very likely to continue to do more over the next several years. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Clay, the same question for you. Great. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks to um, CSIS, and, and thank you, Nico. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here today. I'm with Jensen Controls. Um, uh, we're a, a Midwestern company, sort of. Um, in 1883, our founder, Professor Warren Jensen, invented the thermostat. Coincidentally, across the country in Pennsylvania, a gentleman named John Frick was inventing industrial refrigeration. Those companies came together about 110 years later and formed the basis for Johnson Controls today. Our business is in heating, ventilating, air conditioning, industrial refrigeration, building controls, life safety, and security systems. Um, I tried to count how many times efficiency and cooling came up in the first panel, and I lost count. That could not be a better uh, introduction to our company, I think. We are global leaders in efficiency and in cooling. We operate in 150 countries. Specifically about the Indo-Pacific, uh, $7.2 billion in revenue. We've been there for a really, really long time. We have 300 uh, company offices, 20,000 employees. If I double click on India, which seems to come up every uh, couple minutes here, uh, we have 3,000 employees. We're in 150 cities and we have 250 partners selling our products, many of which are exported from the United States. Um, being from the private sector, um, we know the importance of policies as key enablers for, for markets, but um, we also believe that without purchase orders, there's no progress. So we tend to take a market-focused view, and we've done a study for 11 years. Uh, last year was 20 countries, 1,900 organizations that buy energy efficiency, renewable energy, and smart tech technologies for uh, buildings. Some of the highlights in the Indo-Pacific region from the research, the key drivers of investment are energy cost, greenhouse gas emissions, energy security and resilience. The only region in the world where energy security and resilience were in the top four. I think it's critically important in this particular region. The barriers um, were also fairly unique. Financing, which often comes up, but it's about financing options, the availability of low cost finance for those improvements because they don't have capital budget. And interestingly enough, lack of private sector participation. That came out as unique of all the regions in the world. Um, one of the interesting things is we also survey about smart cities and communities and things like that. The, the uh, top drivers for investment are sustainability and environmental protection. Number two, economic development. And three, public safety. I think therein lies the opportunity for us to increase our exports to the region and bring our critical and, and, and very strong technologies from, from the U US. There's a few challenges in energy efficiency, right? The projects tend to be very small. Because they're very small, it's very difficult to get financing, even through ADB and other sources like that. Um, Working with the private sector in some of these countries is a little bit challenging. If you think back to what Senator Gardner talked about regulatory issues and compliance and legal structures, things like that. Um, the typical commercial building in India, for instance, has a little bitty window air conditioner or a split system, which is not very efficient. When somebody gets hot, they go down the, 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 the street and buy an inefficient air conditioner. That's not exactly state of the art in either uh, energy efficiency or, or certainly performance. And building codes, um, they have a great set of building codes by the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, 
but individual provinces get to adopt them and enforcement is an entirely other issue. So there's a few barriers there. Cory Gardner, again, said the obvious thing. Well, if we were over there, we would just do energy savings performance contracting. We invest in the public sector $8 billion a year. It's a market-based approach. No taxpayer dollars, no utility rates. Um, um, impact there, but um, work in the public sector there is very, very challenging. So one idea is, in fact, how do we get scale? How do we get large enough projects um, if you look at the growth of industrial parks, they're just enormous. And I think there's a great opportunity to take more of a systems approach, an integrated energy approach, if you will, that would incorporate distributed generation, energy storage, microgrids. You'd be able to put in place the standards around energy efficiency. You'd be able to deliver cooling, heating, power as a service. It would solve the financing issue. It would solve um, a, a lot of issues, frankly, and we see a tremendous difference in India when we're working with TCS and Infosys and we're working with technology parks. They're among the greenest, they're among the most sustainable facilities there are. But what we need to do is take that model and replicate it. So I think it's a very exciting area. If you're in the cooling and efficiency business, you have to be in the Indo-Pacific. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for the private sector. I think you've almost teed up your follow-up question, which is how we're going to do that integrated approach. But we'll mm -hmm. come back to that. Uh, Tommy, now on to you. Uh, thank you very much. It's such an honor to be here. Uh, and thanks to CSIS. Uh, and it's great to be with uh, my interagency colleagues that, uh, to talk about energy security in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, I come from the Department of Energy, Office of International Affairs, uh, where I, uh, I lead the, the uh, global energy security offices and the uh, multilateral uh, engagement office. Uh, one of the things that you, you notice uh, in a common denominator uh, for successful economies throughout uh, modern history is their access to reliable energy. It's energy uh, security. Uh, and energy security leads to national security. Without energy security, uh, nations inadvertently leave themselves open up to poor infrastructure, uh, vulnerabilities, uh, price hikes, supply disruptions, and political uh, coercion. The, uh, that's why that, uh, energy security is such a, an important topic here for Asia Edge. And you can see the, the tenets of energy security throughout each of the, the four strategic objectives. And that's everything from the diversity of uh, routes, supplies, and sources. Uh, it's about uh, open markets, transparency. Uh, it's also about uh, the reciprocal trade and access to, to reliable energy. Uh, in, in this historic age that Secretary Perry has called the, uh, the era of America energy abundance, the energy security is now possible uh, for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and it's no less possible for the Indo-Pacific now than it is for Europe or Africa or these other nations around the world. Uh, it, this is a major focus for the entire U.S. government. Uh, it, it's a priority for the Secretary of Energy, and it's actually why our Office of Global Energy Security was created. Uh, part of this is really the, the realization that, that we've got, uh, you know, as Dave Turk was talking about, a, a huge opportunity here in, in the Indo-Pacific with uh, what we expect to be a growth of uh, five-fold in the imports of LNG. I, I think that that shows that there's a tremendous opportunity, not just for the United States, but for the Indo-Pacific here to get energy security finally. And, uh, and we're, we're looking forward to, to partnering with them on that. Uh, the reason here that, that there's such an abundant source of energy now from the United States has a lot to do with our focus on innovation. Uh, and a great part of that is due to, to the Department of Energy's national labs. I, let me quickly just go over a couple areas where I think that, uh, where we are operating now in the Indo-Pacific and where I think that we could uh, probably do some, some additional opportunities uh, to partner with these countries. And I think I'll say that the most important thing that we can do now is, con is make sure that this uh, era of American energy abundance continues. Uh, and that, that will ensure that there's always this other uh, supplier, this other opportunity to get new sources out to, uh, to the Indo-Pacific and other regions of the world uh, in that regard. Uh, second to that, I'd say that the, the same labs that made this, this era possible 
uh, are available now. And they want to provide some of these technologies or expertise to work with countries in the Indo-Pacific so that they can realize their own, or own energy abundance, their own uh, success in whatever energy mix that they choose. I'll also add there that, that these, the labs are, are, more, uh, are very keen to, to work and share new technologies that we're working on. Uh, and this is everything from uh, carbon capture utilization and storage. Uh, it's uh, optimization of coal-fired power plants. And, and they're more than willing to work with countries and help with feasibility studies, the things that, that USTDA was, uh, was discussing. The, uh, another area that we're looking at is, is LNG and, and providing LNG to island nations that couldn't typically get it because maybe it's the small scale of the, uh, the imports that they receive. So our labs are looking at small scale uh, LNG tankers and uh, small scale uh, floating surface uh, regasification units and storage. So I think this will do a lot because you can imagine all the coastline that we've got in these countries in this area. I think that's very important. Another area that's, that's less often discussed and it's a future technology is small modular reactors. And the, the reason I mention that is that small modular reactors have the capability here to uh, provide multiple different uh, customary benefits. These include desalinization, uh, it includes uh, heat processing for, for industrial activities, uh, but it's also really the small cost that these things are going to come with. Uh, the small cost and the, sm the shorter timeline are going to make these accessible to more developing countries, and I think that's a, a really good opportunity for the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, by expanding our presence, uh, and this is what DOE wants to do, by expanding our presence in the Indo-Pacific, uh, we believe that uh, we'll support and enhance our, our long-term commitment that we've already got to the to this, uh, this area. And we believe that we can show that, that energy can truly be a, a, a currency for peace and prosperity. Thank you, Tommy. You put a lot of very exciting opportunities on the table, and I appreciate the shout out to the national labs. I'm probably going to come back to you and maybe ask you what do you see the challenges are in realizing some of these things. LNG has come up a couple of times, couple and times. I think I know someone <laughs> who might have some thoughts about LNG. All right, go. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Nikos. Thank you, uh, CSIS. <clears throat> it, it has come up a couple times. Thanks to everybody for <laughs> teaming me up so I could just like swing this out quick. Um, those who don't know uh, about Chenier Energy, uh, essentially we uh, operate out of two locations in Sabine, Sabine Pass, which is in Louisiana, and now Corpus Christi in obviously Corpus Christi, Texas. Uh, we purchase uh, U.S. natural gas, freeze it into a liquid, and, and send it globally. Um, nearly half of those shipments uh, to date were just over 700 shipments globally. Half of those have been to uh, the Indo-Pacific region. And so energy trends in the region, if you do it by volume and by sales, this is a very important uh, region. Uh, we found uh, many opportunities here and, and continuing opportunities uh, as, the, as the other panelists have, have mentioned. Um, there's so much to, to even tap into that that's just, as, as uh, you mentioned with Johnson Controls, that it, it's really the beginning. And of our 19 long-term contracts, seven are with, uh, are with those in the Indo-Pacific area. And, and that's really just only the burgeoning of, of many of those countries. And, uh, really starting to get that, that energy security, that energy diversity, all the isms that, 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 uh, that we speak of that, um, that, that we think is really just at the beginning. And as Chenier is the, the first uh, US LNG company to export internationally from the lower 48, um, it's, it's really just the beginning on the US side that there are uh, many other US-based uh, LNG companies that, that are, uh, one has uh, recently commissioned, uh, that an additional one has recently commissioned, so which would add three now uh, to, the, to the mix, and, and there's many others. Um, just check out any FERC meeting. You, you can see what's in the queue, and, and it's a very exciting time. Fantastic. I'll probably come back to you, uh, talk a little bit about the the challenges of when you when you, you talked about over half of the gas going to Asia, uh, at that 
is very concentrated. There's a few markets that are taking a lot, and uh, we can probably do better in diversifying that geographic spread. So, Correct. So we'll probably come back to you on that. Um, Dave, I, I promised you we're going to come back and talk about uh, solar, but maybe also a little bit about coal uh, in the region. So you sort of finished off your initial remarks saying uh, countries could be doing a little bit more on solar. So why don't you continue that sentence? <laughs> yeah, I, I, absolutely. And maybe before getting to solar in particular, um, with all this extra energy demand, uh, depending on the fuel, of course, um, you have all sorts of consequences from that. Certainly you have the air pollution imperative, which is an imperative in many countries. Certainly we've heard about that in China for many, many years. Uh, we're seeing it more and more in India as a real driver of the need for uh, cleaner sources of energy and, and pollution controls. And we're seeing it in other countries within the region as well. Um, we're also seeing CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions uh, more generally. Just to give you a couple numbers there of both the uh, footprint currently and then where the trends are going in the future. Uh, one on the China side, which is the biggest uh, by far uh, uh, CO2 emitter. So uh, we have roughly in the energy space, which is the bulk of CO2 emissions, 33.1 gigawatt or gigatons of emissions. Right now, China is 9.5 uh, uh, gigatons of that. So that's uh, just under 30% of global emissions just coming from China, just to give you a sense, not only of China's scale, and it's, uh, that's a big additions over recent time, but also the potential for others in the region who are going in uh, you know, uh, the, the kind of the development curve, if you will. So India, India is much uh, lower in terms of its percentage. I think it's around seven or so percent of global emissions coming from India. That's a very low number given India's population size, uh, given the economic development even we've seen over time. Uh, just to give you a sense of the per capita emissions, it's about 40% per capita emissions uh, from the global average. So quite a bit lower than the global average, and there's obviously countries above the global average, below the global average. Uh, if you look at India's trajectory, uh, given its development curve where it's at, you could expect that 7% to go somewhere to maybe 14, 15%, depending on all sorts of decisions, how much solar, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But that's just to give you a sense of the, the kind of CO2 footprint uh, side of things. So what we're seeing in uh, renewables, uh, in solar in particular, but we have other renewable capabilities uh, certainly within the region. Um, you've got hydro, you've got some wind assets, you've got some other opportunities as well. Uh, solar is one of the most exciting and there are some very rich opportunities in terms of the solar resource, certainly in India but in other parts of Southeast Asia. India put on the table a very aggressive target on solar. Uh, they're also heading the International Solar Alliance, and it's been a very big focus of efforts. I gave the numbers about 10 uh, gigawatts of solar the past couple of years from the India front, which are very, very impressive numbers. And we're just seeing some learning by doing. We're seeing some cost reductions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. As I mentioned, other countries in the regions aren't doing as well. Um, and there's a number of, of reasons for that. Some of them we've talked about more broadly on this panel and the panel uh, before, some of the regulatory certainty, some of the um, risk for a private sector to come in and, and, and take advantage of these opportunities. Uh, what we're going to see um, in many cases in these countries is a bit of a race. There is an insatiable demand for energy. Energy is a good thing. The emissions are the bad part of the equation how much of that increased demand can be filled um, at volume, at scale, with the solar, with the wind? How do the countries deal with those grid integration issues that will need to be dealt with increasingly, especially as you get to higher and higher levels of percentage, versus how, many, uh, how much other fuel uh, is into the mix? Uh, on the coal front, which, uh, um, uh, just to give you a couple, uh, couple, numbers, uh, couple numbers on that front, Maybe just one number, um, which I think is the one that needs to be thought of the most, maybe in the Asia context more generally, is the average life of, uh, of a power plant right now in advanced economies is 30, 40 years uh, kind of time frame. Uh, in Asia, it's about 10 years. So a lot of new build coal, or recent, coal recently, some of that ongoing. So um, obviously that's to fuel those uh, energy access improvements, that's to fuel the economic development uh, those kinds of things, but it does have an emission component to it. Now, you can deal with those emissions in any number of ways. Certainly, CCUS may be an interesting uh, carbon capture utilization and storage, may be an interesting cost-effective opportunity. There's a number of countries in the region looking at the utilization in particular. Can you take that CO2? Can you do something with that 
uh, use it in a product of some kind. You get certain volumes there, but if you really want to get it huge volumes, you've got to have some storage uh, component uh, to it as well. Efficiency is, of course, incredibly important. I raised that before. Uh, Clay uh, mentioned some of the both opportunities and challenges, and I'm really curious to hear more on the system integration approach in the industrial parks. Clay, I think that's a really interesting idea to really uh, take advantage of some opportunities in these countries. Um, the less, uh, the, the more efficient these countries are, all countries are, frankly, then the less energy demand that you will need, and then more of that race with solar, wind, other renewables, uh, more cleaner uh, sources can fill that, uh, that need from an energy demand, uh, energy demand side of things. This uh, uh, region is also, of course, very dynamic in a whole range of clean energy technologies. Electric vehicles is one. It's a real priority for many countries in the region. When we go in India or Indonesia or others, there's uh, very aggressive plans uh, to really roll out electric vehicles around uh, the region. Right now, uh, in 2018, we saw a record number of electric vehicles, about 2 uh, million sold globally. 45% uh, of those were just in China. Again, just to give you one uh, data nugget of uh, the importance of uh, the, the Asia region generally, but we're going to see those kinds of numbers, I think, uh, coming from India, coming from other countries in the regions as well. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, just to tee up your next question so you can think about it as we go down, uh, because a, a few of you have talked about partner countries, so I do want to come back to this question of, you know, how do you engage essentially with non-members and, and talk a little bit about the progress that the IA has made on that, uh, on that front. Uh, Todd, let me come to you. Uh, Frank Fannin this morning said, you know, if the rules are fair, if everything is a uh, level playing field, the U.S. can show up and can compete. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Talk a little bit about procurement, fair and open markets. How do you, uh, how do you get there? What is, um, what is USDA doing on that, on that front? Sure. So uh, earlier in this decade, we had a lot of members of the U.S. industry come to us and say, you know, we're not even bidding on international tenders anymore because we just can't win. Bottom line is most of these procurement officials are using low cost to determine the winning bidders. And with U.S. technology, we just can't compete because we're never the lowest cost. And so internally within the agency, we took a, a hard look to see what we could do to offset that problem. And in 2013, we came up with what's called the Global Procurement Initiative at USTDA. And through our initiative, we partner with countries across the globe uh, and help their procurement officials learn to move away from low cost and focus on life cycle cost analysis and best value. And today, we've got 11 partner countries across the globe that we're working with, including in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, the state of Maharashtra in India, mm -hmm. as well as Vietnam and the Philippines. Uh, we had our global procurement team in the Philippines just last month, uh, where we're embedding two technical advisors within the government uh, to teach them how to really utilize uh, low cost, uh, or not low cost, but life cycle cost analysis and best value. Uh, over the course of uh, the six years that we've been utilizing the program, uh, we've seen a, a pretty substantial turnaround. We've actually partnered with the World Bank as well and helped the bank change their procurement process completely to focus on life cycle cost analysis. And so we're starting to see more U.S. companies go in and not only bid, but also win. Uh, and so we don't just do this with partner countries. We can also do it. Be, to join the partnership, uh, it's a, a pretty substantial uh, ask for the countries that, that do become partners. They've got to go in and change their laws. They've got to you know, really turn things around in terms of procurement. Uh, but for countries that can't quite get there yet, that are not ready to become partners with GPI, we'll, we'll still be able to help them if they're interested in, in particular uh, tenders that they want to put out. Uh, so we've got international experts within energy and a number of other sectors that are uh, ready to answer questions and assist. Uh, where needed in order to, to allow the U.S. industry folks that are out there that want to compete, that want to go out and pursue these tenders, to be able to do that and, and like I said, eventually win. Uh, we're seeing a ton of success there. Our GPI program has grown substantially over the past six years, uh, and we're looking to bring on, bring on more partners uh, across the globe and within the Indo-Pacific region. Fantastic. And, and I think I, I may come back to you sort of building up on what I asked Dave. I think the question of there are other countries on the developed side of Japan, Australia, that sort of have a similar interest in seeing the, the region take a slightly more inclusive view, as you said, not just kind of like low cost. So um, I'd love to hear any thoughts you have in terms of how the U.S. is or could be doing better with its partners. Sure. Uh, 
you've gotten us all excited about the integrated approach, the industrial park, so mm -hmm. you've, got to, you've got to defend yourself now. So tell us how it's going to work. And all right, bring it on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, intriguing thing about industrial parks is, is, is um, one, there are a lot being built. And um, we've been involved in a lot of reverse trade missions. And um, I, I'm, I am always struck by when the U.S. companies come together and present their capabilities and their case studies and where they've been successful, it is truly a dream team, you know? If you were developing an industrial park anywhere, these are exactly the companies and technologies you would like. Now, procurement issues and, and, and wanting the lowest cost, those are kind of barriers. But sometimes it's a way to solve a problem like this to actually make it a little bit bigger and more complex. If you envision an industrial park with a central energy plant that is um, creating, you know, using distributed generation, um, uses the highest efficiency cooling and refrigeration equipment, um, uses heat recovery processes to get every BTU of heat for process industries, if you um, put in place high standards for the buildings themselves so they were efficient, if you um, put in LED lighting in the whole area, if you optimize transportation and logistics, well now I've essentially created a, a, a small community which is hyper efficient and can take advantage of things like microgrids and storage and whether that be chilled water or battery or whatever. Um, by bringing the technologies and the companies together, I think you can deliver essentially a design and a package. It's also much easier to finance, right? These are all credit worthy companies with great reputations. They'll stand by the performance of their technologies, much more able to attract both concessionary finance as, as well as pri pri private capital into this. So I think there's something interesting about that. And, and if you look at major airports in the Indo-Pacific region, they're LEED certified, they're efficient, they're reliable, they use all this kind of technology. I think we know how to do it. I uh, keep reading about New Clark City in the Philippines, which is being designed to be the backup capital to Manila, which is like next to a volcano, over a fault, and subject to monsoons, right? And it's, it's, it's the old air base that we know so well. And there's going to be 1.2 million people there. There's going to be industry, high tech. It's, it's a wonderful place. It's being built from scratch, right? And I just wonder if there isn't a way, through your help and the Department of Energy, the national labs, we've been involved in a lot of bilateral uh, right. consortium of U.S. companies and, and countries in the Indo-Pacific whether there's an opportunity to come in and, and provide a value proposition which, which, which really gives preference to the great technologies which we have. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, there's a, a couple of things that you've teed up for us. We'll see how, how we're doing with time, but you know, you've talked about financing a couple of times. Maybe we can come back to that on the smaller scale of things. I'd love to hear what we can do. Uh, but also, also, we would love to hear so sort of what the U.S. government could be doing more to sort of assist you with that. So maybe mm -hmm. uh, think about that. Um, Tommy, I, I said I was going to come back to you, and, and, and your opening was, was extraordinary in painting the opportunities, but maybe uh, put you a little bit on the spot to talk about sort of the challenges to getting there and sort of what, how, do you, how do you see those, uh, what are those challenges, and how are you thinking about how to overcome them? Uh, thanks, thanks, Clay, for that plug. I'll, I'll pay you afterwards. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so the DOE has, uh, we have several opportunities and uh, engagements in, in, throughout the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we're always open to, to looking for more and, and we, we definitely pay attention to what, what challenges we have to make sure that those are successful. Uh, it, we work in, we work now mostly, uh, I would say bilaterally and we work multilaterally uh, with uh, multilaterals like the International Energy Agency, we work with Dave uh, pretty regularly. In fact, we're spending a lot of time in Paris. The uh, International Framework for Nuclear Energy Cooperation, the Asia Pacific Economic uh, Cooperation, and, uh, it, and just many of these. So it, let me go through a, a couple of these, uh, these engagements. In, in India, we have the, the U.S.-India Strategic Economic or uh, Strategic Energy Partnership. It was launched by Secretary Perry in, in April of 2018. We use that for lots of projects in energy security, uh, cooperation with uh, commercial entities. Clay mentioned how that, that sort of works. 
uh, in working on innovation opportunities. Uh, we also have this, this U.S.-India gas task force that, uh, that gets uh, commercial entities together to discuss how they can unlock the potential for natural gas in India. It, Indonesia is another one. Uh, we have the, uh, a strategic partner there uh, that, uh, in this energy policy dialogue. Uh, Lawrence, Liver, uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab has actually figured out how to take uh, 10 gigawatts of, uh, of electricity or, or uh, need demand for electricity off the, uh, the grid. So basically they have 10 gigawatts of additional electricity left. I mean, that's, a, that's an amazing feat. If you that provides them so much more opportunity to, to fulfill access to other areas and, and actually bring costs and things down. Uh, in Singapore, we have a, uh, a number of pilot projects in energy storage uh, and connecting them to microgrids. Microgrids, are, uh, uh, microgrids and smart grids are a big topic right now. We're also creating best practices for them to discuss how uh, these new energy storage technologies being developed in our national labs can be used to, to help them with their, their needs because you, know, you take Singapore as a, a very small country they're investing a lot in renewables, they'll need, because of the variability uh, inherent in renewables, they'll need to be able to store that, tech, that, uh, that energy and get it out there. Uh, the lower Mekong uh, countries, we're working uh, with the Department of State to, uh, to help with the uh, just practical ways to, to manage uh, data on the inefficient usage of, of water and energy there. Uh, we're trying to create opportunities for the sustainable development of that, that region. A APEC, I, I mentioned that earlier, but that's another area that's, uh, that's been really helpful for us, and it's gotten us in front of a lot of countries. I, I think that's really the, one of the main uh, reasons that, that multilaterals are helpful. You can get in a room with multiple countries and, and have them provide what their needs are to you, and, and that's how we, we use APEC. It, they've been helpful in, in providing us opportunities to meet with countries on uh, CCUS, countries interested in uh, optimizing their, their coal-fired power plants, uh, making those uh, much more clean. And, and also, and this is a, a really big opportunity for a lot of places, but they're taking a look at the, their electrical grid and the infrastructure and finding out what the vulnerabilities are. And not only doing that, but, but preparing them uh, for disruptions, possible disruptions, and uh, lowering the recovery times. I think that's really essential, especially in these countries that are very prone, as we mentioned earlier, to, to sorts of uh, natural disasters. We have a number of other strategic partnerships in the Indo-Pacific, and that's Japan, Korea, Pakistan, Taiwan, I can't name them all, but these cover everything, the gamut from strategic energy dialogues to cooperation in nuclear energy, a lot of research and development activities. In fact, Japan at the G20 launched the RD20, and it's a new initiative that they're working on for each year to, to look at R&D in the clean energy space. I think that's something to, to look forward to. I believe it's going to happen. And, in Paris in the near future. I'm not sure if it's announced yet. So, uh, but it is it is public. It is now. It is now. The last panel making news. <laughs> making news. Tweet that one out. Uh, I, I do want to address really quick. I mean, so there's a number of opportunities that we're engaged in, but I, I want to address what uh, Senator Gardner mentioned earlier. Uh, the ARIA, the uh, the Asia uh, Reassurance Initiative. It, just huge for the whole government. Uh, we're excited about using this to, to help create this an energy strategy that, which complements the, the president's mandate through the national security strategy. And so we'll, we're working with the Department of State to, to develop this, but it, it mandates the Department of Energy labs be involved in, in uh, developing new ways for them to create economic prosperity and growth in the region. So that I'll just close by saying the, the, the U.S. will remain a leader in innovation and technology, and we're going to be partnered uh, right there with uh, the citizens in the Indo-Pacific to make sure that they, can re they have the freedom to realize their own energy future. Thank you, and I, and I really appreciated your focus on both of your comments on security and vulnerability. We may, we may sort of come back on that. Uh, by the way, we're, we're going to bleed a little bit o over time since we started a little bit late, so if you do need to leave at 11.30, please feel free to do that, but we'll take about 10 more minutes, 15 min more minutes uh, at the end of that. Um, uh, Carrie, I wanted to come to you on, on uh, one question that kind of 
I, I think we've heard a little bit about, but uh, I certainly encounter a lot, is this idea that, you know, we'd love to do gas, but gas is too expensive. We don't, we can't really afford it. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you see uh, the ability of gas to compete, how can the region use more gas, particularly in the context of some of the staggering numbers that, uh, that Dave put on the table mm -hmm. on coal. Um, but also, I think one of the discussions that has come up a lot in this town over the last few months and longer is, you know, what can the U.S. government do uh, to support that effort? Uh, I always like to say that if you want to export gas from anywhere in the world, the U.S. government has a has some money for you, but if you want to sort of sell gas into this region, the, the toolkit may not necessarily be there. So maybe share some thoughts on sort of the, the U.S. Sure. government side of things. Sure, and, and I, I am going to largely draw from a, a lot of uh, um, Dave and Todd, but also Clay as well, in that um, where I, I do think LNG, you know, again speaking from, from U.S. LNG, U.S. natural gas, where we're competitive is really the starting um, benefit we have of, of supply of U.S. natural gas, right? So we'll start there uh, where, where our, our, our pricing is, is very competitive against the global market. Um, but then turning to exactly your question that, um, and, and I like how you laid it out with the industrial parks, that you have those in the region who need this energy who are building out uh, at, at, at such a pace um, that they need that base load, right? Let, let, let's, let's say what it is. And that um, what's interesting, they have all these options, um, and, and some of it is cost driven, but what we continue to see is, is this desire for that diversity, for you know, energy security, and, and that um, to that, again, U.S. natural gas has that place. The, where the U.S. government is helping with Asia Edge, et cetera, is, is those resources on the receiving country's end, right? That um, you know, we as, as Chenier aren't, aren't, we operate in Louisiana and Texas, right? We, we, we don't have uh, facilities in, in other countries. We send ships to uh, there, and it's it's where the U.S. government can can help those receiving areas with the the resources, tools, the the pathways to, to help build out. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the, yes, the in industrial parks are great, but then how is that power coming to the industrial park, and and what are the conduits that that, that mm -hmm. how that gets there? Obviously, Chenier Energy would love to, you know, be, be plugged into that. But in many of these areas, because it's all, the blessing is it's coming so quickly, right, um, that sometimes it, it's making that connection. Right? And when you look at uh, other areas of the world, their energy ramp up was over, you know, 100 years uh, or, or more, um, that this is happening now that, that you have in a very valid way, as, as David put it, that coal and uh, you know, hydrogen or solar mm -hmm. is in the same conversation almost flatly. That's interesting, right? <laughs> and, and that's uh, unique to that, that region. Fantastic. I, I know I gave you all questions, assignments as we were going down, but I also looked at the time. And, and I realized that if we do another round, then we won't really have a chance to bring in the audience. So. Um, you can try to integrate uh, some of the, the questions maybe uh, as we go to the audience. But I wanted to bring you, uh, you all in. Um, same rules as before, please wait for the mic. Uh, please state your name and affiliation and question in the form of a question. Do we have some takers? If not, I've already given them questions, but yes, please, gentlemen. Up here. Uh, Seth Rose, NRF Institute to Clay. Uh, also very interested in the industrial park uh, scenario. Uh, JCI uh, offers planning, financing, and technology. So I wonder, um, and, and it doesn't seem that complicated to understand that first cost versus life cycle cost. Uh, you invest up front and you, and, you, and you see the return. What are the market obstacles in Asia that JCI has found op, you know, um, keeping it from being more standard? 
you want to collect a bunch or you just want me to answer? I feel like people are still warming up, so. Okay, I'll answer it kind of quickly. I mean, um, the, the traditional way of delivering something like that would be through a public-private partnership. And, 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 and of course, a public-private partnership needs a certain legal structure. Um, um, in many of the countries we're talking about, um, utilities that are state-owned might have a wee bit of a, um, 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 be challenged by the fact that you're going to generate your own um, power and things such as that. So you sort of end up being a utility, you end up being a, a, a municipality almost. It's a number of different companies coming together. Um, the very large technology companies generally don't use their own money to finance this. There's usually a financial partner. So it is a relatively complicated structure. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to turnkey um, an entire city from a single vendor or a small collection of vendors. Um, I would view it more as a model and something to drive towards and then um, hope that the financial and technology partners can work together on, a, on, on an as-needed basis to, to deliver a lower low-cost solution. Sarah. Thanks very much, it's been a really interesting panel. So a couple of things I was curious about is the role of uh, state-owned enterprises in the region, right? Huge amount of an investment, um, particularly in this region, coming from you know, sort of non-competitive markets and or public sector financing, public se the role of the public sector. I'm just curious, uh, to where does that yield benefits uh, to trying to accomplish certain things in the region in terms of the infrastructure build out and where does it really sort of hamper the ability to get certain kinds of projects done or underway. I'd love to hear from as many people as would like to chime in on that. Uh, I'll say that we, we work with a number of state-owned enterprises in the work that we do. Uh, public sector, private sector, it doesn't matter to us, but uh, the, the projects that we work on uh, with our, with our state-owned enterprise partners, uh, whether it be in the Indo-Pacific or anywhere else, uh, for us, it's, 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 it's good because we have the ability to know that the government has prioritized that project for one thing. Mm -hmm. um, they may have the ability to finance those things themselves. Uh, and if they don't, we obviously have a number of different financial vehicles that we can help them with. But uh, for us, the, the, bigger, the bigger obstacle is to try to figure out a way to ensure that once the feasibility study or whatever it is that we're helping them with is done and we move to project implementation, that U.S. companies have the ability to compete for that implementation project, um, which is why we do the work that we do on technical assistance and GPI and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, but we found, we found that working with state-owned enterprises is, uh, is typically a pretty good deal. And uh, Anyone else want to chime in? I mean, Dave, you, you know, one of the things I always take uh, away from the investment report of the IEA is just how much of the investment is either driven by state-owned enterprises or is in direct response to a, a policy signal uh, by government. So, so in a way, in one way or another, it comes back to the decisions of governments. I don't know if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah ha happy to do that. And I think we were all struck when we did some of that analysis. Um, and we came up with a 70% figure of overall investment in the energy space that is government directed in one way or another, whether state-owned enterprises or other uh, government mechanisms, et cetera. And I'm not sure enough governments recognize <laughs> that influence that they can have. Obviously, you need to think creatively. You need to think about how to use your levers efficiently, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And certainly within this region, you're seeing some uh, very creative uses, uh, procurement power. Think of what India did with bulk procurement and LEDs and driving down costs there. Other schemes that the Bureau of Energy Efficiency and, and others are doing. And you see this kind of, um, you, you, glimmers is too, uh, too small a word, but um, you see some um, real opportunities that might be learned on from different countries, from examples uh, along the lines of what I just mentioned, the India context, uh, and governments to feel empowered to be able to move as big and as quickly uh, as they need to to deal with some of the challenges that they're facing. And I appreciate that because I think there's sometimes a sort of quasi-instinctive aversion to you know, state or enterprise, therefore this is all bad, 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 and, and I appreciate the more nuanced uh, mm -hmm. perspective that both of you uh, put on the table. Um, do I see any questions? No. You guys are all covered. Um, so um, 
If there are no questions, then I may want to give a chance to anyone who wants to respond. I mean, I, I, I tossed around some ideas towards the end of your comments there. If anyone has a sort of burning desire to respond to those, I'd love to give you the, the opportunity for that. Any, any takers? Yeah. Yeah, so um, certainly the question you put on the table, and, and, and I think this is a, a good way certainly from my end to, to, to end this, uh, what has been a terrific, terrific day, terrific panel, is uh, what our experience has been with some of the policymakers in these countries. We are working, as I mentioned at the outset, more and more directly and behind the scenes in many cases with uh, policymakers in India, Indonesia, Thailand, uh, ASEAN, others, uh, others in the region. And to me, there's a, a number of uh, really intriguing lessons learned that I think is uh, uh, quite useful when thinking about Asia Edge or, or other uh, efforts in this area. One is I'm struck by, by how pragmatic a lot of these policymakers, leading different agencies, ministers, others. And given the uh, sheer volume and range of challenges that they're facing all at the same time, you've really got to be pra pragmatic. Otherwise, you probably should let someone else take over the job who's going to get the, the job done. And just think of, uh, you know, can you think of any of these countries, um, the challenges of if you've got energy access issues, trying to bring electricity access to people, the challenge of um, economic development, the challenge of dealing with growth, both population growth, GDP growth on that dynamic scale. It's all, these are all incredibly good things, but trying to deal with them um, all when you're also trying to deal with uh, pollution, as Tommy rightfully said, trying to deal with the energy security issues that you're facing, especially if you're importing, having, imp like that is a huge range of challenges. And so it's incredibly impressive to see the pragmatism of these decision makers. And certainly from the IEA side, we see a huge interest to, uh, to have us channel some of the global expertise and best practices in ways that are independent and credible um, that are useful. And I think that's why we've had such good partnerships with these governments. Secondly, and I mentioned this already in the, uh, the LED example with the Bureau of Energy Efficiency, you see some real policy innovation happening in these countries, maybe a little bit differently than would happen in uh, other countries around the world. And what we're seeing is uh, not only an interest, and again, from the IEA, we're a global energy agency trying to channel best practices for countries who are uh, most uh, interested. We see a lot of uh, appetite to learn from others around the world, but we're also seeing a lot of uh, interest in others around the world learning from some of the things going on in these countries, some of the innovative schemes, uh, innovative systems as well. And that's a, a really, uh, I think, an incredibly, uh, it's not unique to this region, but uh, I think it's especially important to, to this region, the innovation, uh, policy innovation piece as well. The third piece is, and I think this is where uh, certainly governments like the U.S. Uh, can help. We're doing an awful lot of this from the IEA side, and we're a member-driven organization with uh, the U.S. and Japan and other members uh, you know, leading our efforts, is really the training piece of it. You've got some phenomenal leaders of some of these ministries and uh, some of the best bureaucrats I've ever worked with in, in my life. Uh, but especially given the size of the challenges, what you're dealing with, you need a whole cadre of very talented people, uh, training programs that bring in new young people who can, uh, can really implement some of these programs. We're doing trainings around the world on efficiency, system integration of renewables, uh, other issues as well. And I think that's an area where uh, we should think about these relationships for the long haul and try to help these governments best achieve their own, uh, their own objectives. That's fantastic. Thank you. And it's sort of a call to action and I, and I think a, a great way for us to be uh, wrapping up this panel, unless anyone has any uh, uh, burning final thoughts. Uh, well, I just want to thank you all for, for being here. Uh, thank you. We had a, a great roster from the morning to now. Thank you for sticking uh, with us uh, throughout this morning, and please uh, join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>